Chapter 14 of 50 Years in Chains or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 50 Years in Chains or the Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. Chapter 14, Part 2. On the morning of the execution, my master told me, and all the rest of the people, that we must go to the hanging, as it was termed by him as well as others. The place of punishment was only two miles from my master's residence, and I was there in time to get a good stand near the gallows tree by which I was enabled to see all of the proceedings connected with this solemn affair. It was estimated by my master that there were at least fifteen thousand people present at the scene more than half of whom were blacks, all the masters for a great distance round the country having permitted or compelled their people to come to this hanging. Billy was brought to the gallows with Lucy and Frank, but was permitted to walk beside the cart in which they rode. Under the gallows, after the rope was around her neck, Lucy confessed that the murder had been designed by her in the first place, and that Frank had only perpetrated it at her instance. She said she had at first intended to apply to Billy to assist her in the undertaking, but had afterwards communicated her designs to Frank, who offered to shoot her master if she would supply him with a gun and let no other person be in on the secret. A long sermon was preached by a white man under the gallows, which was only the limb of a tree, and afterwards an exhortation was delivered by a black man. The two convicts were hung together, and after they were quite dead, a consultation was held among the gentlemen as to the future disposition of Billy, who, having been in the house when his master was murdered, and not having given immediate information of the fact, was held to be guilty of concealing the death, and was accordingly sentenced to receive five hundred lashes. I was in the branches of a tree close by the place where the court was held, and distinctly heard its proceedings and judgment. Some went to the woods to cut hickories, while others stripped Billy and tied him to a tree. More than twenty long switches, some of them six or seven feet in length, had been procured, and two men applied the rods at the same time, one standing on each side of the culprit, one of them using his left hand. I had often seen black men whipped, and had always, when the lash was applied with great severity, heard the sufferer cry out and beg for mercy. But in this case the pain inflicted by the double blows of the hickory was so intense that Billy never uttered so much as a groan, and I do not believe he breathed for the space of two minutes after he received the first strokes. He shrank his body close to the trunk of the tree, around which his arms and legs were lashed, drew his shoulders up to his head like a dying man, and trembled, or rather shivered in all his members. The blood flowed from the commencement, and in a few minutes lay in small puddles at the root of the tree. I saw flakes of flesh as long as my finger fall out of the gashes in his back, and I believe he was insensible during all of the time that he was receiving the last two hundred lashes. When the whole five hundred lashes had been counted by the person appointed to perform this duty, the half-dead body was unbound and laid in the shade of the tree upon which I sat. The gentlemen who had done the whipping, eight or ten in number, being joined by their friends, then came under the tree and drank punch until their dinner was made ready under a booth of green boughs at a short distance. After dinner, Billy, who had been groaning on the ground where he was laid, was taken up, placed in the cart in which Lucy and Frank had been brought to the gallows, and conveyed to the dwelling of his late master, where he was confined to the house and his bed, more than three months and was never worth much afterwards while I remained in Georgia. Lucy and Frank, after they had been half an hour upon the gallows, were cut down, and suffered to drop into a deep hole that had been dug under them whilst they were suspended. As they fell, so the earth was thrown upon them, and the grave closed over them forever. They were hung on Thursday, and the vast assemblage of people that had convened to witness their death did not leave the place altogether until the next Monday morning. Wagons, carts, and carriages had been brought upon the grounds, booths and tents erected for the convenience and accommodation of the multitude, and the terrible spectacle that I have just described was succeeded by music, 
dancing, trading in horses, gambling, drinking, fighting, and every other species of amusement and excess to which the southern people are addicted. I had to work in the daytime, but went every night to witness this funeral carnival. The numbers that joined in which appeared to increase rather than diminish during the Friday and Saturday that followed the execution. It was not until Sunday afternoon that the crowd began sensibly to diminish, and on Monday morning, after breakfast time, the last wagons left the ground, now trampled into dust as dry and as light as ashes, and the grave of the murderers was left to the solitude of the woods. Certainly those who were hanged well deserved their punishment, but it was a very arbitrary exercise of power to whip a man until he was insensible, because he did not prevent a murder which was committed without his knowledge, and I could not understand the right of punishing him, because he was so weak or timorous as to refrain from the disclosure of the crime the moment it came to his knowledge. It is necessary for the southern people to be vigilant in guarding the moral condition of their slaves, and even to punish the intention to commit crimes when that intention can be clearly proved, for such is the natural relation of master and slave. In by far the greater number of cases that no cordiality of feeling can ever exist between them, and the sentiments that bind together the different members of society in a state of freedom and social equality being absent, the master must resort to principles of physical restraint and rules of mental coercion unknown in another and a different condition of the social compact. It is a mistake to suppose that the southern planters could ever retain their property or live amongst their slaves if those slaves were not kept in terror of the punishment that would follow acts of violence and disorder. There is no difference between the feelings of the different races of men, so far as their personal rights are concerned. The black man is as anxious to possess and to enjoy liberty as the white one would be were he deprived of this inestimable blessing. It is not for me to say that the one is as well qualified for the enjoyment of liberty as the other. Low ignorance, moral degradation of character, and mental depravity are inseparable companions, and in the breast of an ignorant man the passions of envy and revenge hold unbridled dominion. It was in the month of April that I witnessed the painful spectacle of two fellow creatures being launched into the abyss of eternity, and a third being tortured beyond the sufferings of mere death, not for his crimes, but as a terror to others, and this not to deter others from the commission of crimes, but to stimulate them to a more active and devoted performance of their duties to their owners. My spirits had not recovered from the depression produced by that scene, in which my feelings had been awakened in the cause of others, when I was called to a nearer and more immediate apprehension of sufferings, which I now too clearly saw, were in preparation for myself. My master's health became worse continually, and I expected he would not survive this summer. In this, however, I was disappointed, but he was so ill that he was seldom able to come to the field, and paid but little attention to his plantation or the culture of his crops. He left the care of the cotton field to me, and after the month of June, was not out again on the plantation before the following October, when he one day came out on a little Indian pony that he had used as his hackney, before he was so far reduced as to decline the practice of riding. I suffered very much this summer for want of good and substantial provisions, my master being no longer able to supply me with his usual liberality from his own meat-house. I was obliged to lay out nearly all my other earnings in the course of the summer for bacon to enable me to bear the hardship and toil to which I was exposed. My master often sent for me to come to the house and talk to me in a very kind manner, and I believe no hired overseer could have carried on the business more industriously than I did until the crop was secured the next winter. Soon after my master was in the field in October, he sent for me to come to him one day, and gave me on parting a pretty good great coat of strong drab cloth, almost new, which he said would be of service to me in the coming winter. He also gave me, at the same time, a pair of boots, which he had half worn out, but the legs of which were quite good. This great coat and these boots were afterwards of great service to me. 
As the winter came on, my master grew worse, and though he still continued to walk about the house in good weather, it was manifest that he was approaching the close of his earthly existence. I worked very hard this winter. The crop of cotton was heavy, and we did not get it all out of the field until some time after Christmas, which compelled me to work hard myself, and caused my fellow slaves to work hard too, in clearing the land that my master was bound to clear every year on this place. He desired me to get as much of the land cleared in time for cotton as I could, and to plant the rest with corn when cleared off. As I was now entrusted with the entire superintendence of the plantation by my master, who never left his house, it became necessary for me to assume the authority of an overseer of my fellow slaves, and I not unfrequently found it proper to punish them with stripes to compel them to perform their work. At first I felt much repugnance against the use of the hickory, the only instrument with which I punished offenders. But the longer I was accustomed to this practice, the more familiar and less offensive it became to me, and I believe that a few years of perseverance and experience would have made me as inveterate a negro driver as any in Georgia, though I felt conscious that I should never have become so hardened as to strip a person for the purpose of whipping nor should I ever have consented to compel people to work without a sufficiency of good food if I had it in my power to supply them with enough of this first of comforts. In the month of February my master became so weak, and his cough was so distressing, that he took to his bed, from which he never again departed, save only once, before the time when he was removed to be wrapped in his winding sheet. In the month of March, two of the brothers of my mistress came to see her, and remained with her until after the death of my master. When they had been with their sister about three weeks, they came to the kitchen one day when I had come in for my dinner, and told me that they were going to whip me. I asked them what they were going to whip me for, to which they replied that they thought a good whipping would be good for me, and that at any rate I must be prepared to take it. My mistress now joined us, and after swearing at me in the most furious manner for a space of several minutes, and bestowing upon me a multitude of the coarsest epithets, told me that she had long owed me a whipping, and that I should now get it. She then ordered me to take off my shirt, the only garment I had on, except for a pair of old tow linen trousers, and the two brothers backed the command of their sister, the one by presenting a pistol at my breast and the other by drawing a large club over his head, in the attitude of striking me. Resistance was vain, and I was forced to yield. My shirt being off, I was tied by the hands with a stout bed-cord, and being led to a tree, called the Pride of China, that grew in the yard, my hands were drawn by the rope, being passed over a limb, until my feet no longer touched the ground. Being thus suspended in the air by the rope, and my whole weight hanging on my wrists, I was unable to move any part of my person except my feet and legs. I had never been whipped since I was a boy, and felt the injustice of the present proceedings with the utmost keenness, but neither justice nor my feelings had any influence upon the hearts of my mistress and her brothers, two men as cruel in temper and as savage in manners as herself. The first strokes of the hickory produced a sensation that I can only liken to streams of scalding water running along my back, but after a hundred or a hundred and fifty lashes had been showered upon me, the pain became less acute and piercing, but was succeeded by a dead and painful aching, which seemed to extend to my very backbone. As I hung by the rope, the moving of my legs sometimes caused me to turn round, and soon after they began to beat me, I saw the pale and death-like figure of my master standing at the door when my face was turned toward the house, and heard him, in a faint voice, scarcely louder than a strong breathing, commanding his brother-in-laws to let me go. These commands were disregarded until I had received full three hundred lashes, and doubtlessly more would have been inflicted upon me, had not my master, with an effort beyond his strength, by the aid of a stick on which he supported himself, made his way to me, and placing his skeleton form beside me as I hung, told his brothers-in-law that if they struck another stroke, he would send for a lawyer and have them both prosecuted at law. This interposition stopped the progress of my punishment, 
and after cutting me down, they carried my master again into the house. I was yet able to walk, and went into the kitchen, whither my mistress followed, and compelled me to submit to be washed in brine by a black woman who acted as her cook. I was then permitted to put my shirt on and to go on to my bed. This was Saturday, and on the next day when I awoke late in the morning, I found myself unable to turn over or to rise. I felt too indignant at the barbarity with which I had been treated to call for help from any one, and lay in my bed made of corn husks until after twelve o'clock, when my mistress came to me and asked how I was. A slave must not manifest feelings of resentment, and I answered with humility that I was very sore and unable to get up. She then called a man and a woman who came and raised me up, but I now found that my shirt was as fast to my back as if it had grown there, the blood and bruised flesh having become incorporated with the substance of the linen. It formed only the outer coat of the great scab that covered my back. After I was downstairs, my mistress had me washed in warm water, and warm grease was rubbed over my back and sides, until the shirt was saturated with oil, and becoming soft, was at length separated from my back. My mistress then had my back washed and greased, and put upon me one of my master's old linen shirts, because she had become alarmed, and was fearful either that I should die, or would not be able to work again for a long time. As it was, she lost a month of my labor at this time, and in the end she lost myself, in consequence of this whipping. As soon as I was able to walk, my master sent for me to come to his bedside, and told me that he was very sorry for what had happened, that it was not his fault, and that if he had been well I should never have been touched. Tears came in his eyes as he talked to me, and said that as he could not live long, he hoped I would continue faithful to him whilst he did live. And this I promised to do, for I really loved my master. But I had already determined that as soon as he was in his grave, I would attempt to escape from Georgia and the cotton country, if my life should be the forfeiture of the attempt. As soon as I had recovered of my wounds, I again went to work. Not in my former situation of superintendent of my master's plantation, for this place was now occupied by one of the brothers of my mistress, but in the woods where my mistress had determined to clear a new field. After this time I did nothing but grub and clear land while I remained in Georgia, but I was always making preparations for my departure from that country. My master was an officer of militia, and had a sword which he wore on parade days, and at other times he hung it up in the room where he slept. I conceived an idea that this sword would be of service to me in the long journey that I intended to undertake. One evening, when I had gone in to see my master, and had remained standing at his bedside some time, he closed his eyes as if going to sleep, and it being twilight, I slipped the sword from the place where it hung, and dropped it out of the window. I knew my master could never need this weapon again, but yet I felt some compunction of conscience at the thought of robbing so good a man. When I left the room, I took up the sword, and afterwards secreted it in a hollow tree in the woods, near the place at which I worked daily. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15 of Fifty Years in Chains or the life of an american slave this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by maria casper 50 years in chains or the life of an american slave by charles ball chapter 15 my master died in the month of may and I followed him to his grave with a heavy heart. For I felt that I had lost the only friend I had in the world, who possessed at once the power and the inclination to protect me against the tyranny and oppression to which slaves on a cotton plantation are subject. Had he lived, I should have remained with him, and never have left him, for he had promised to purchase the residue of my time of my owners in Carolina, but when he was gone i felt the parting of the last tie that bound me to the place where i then was 
and my heart yearned for my wife and children, from whom I had now been separated more than four years. I held my life in small estimation if it was to be worn out under the dominion of my mistress and her brothers, though since the death of my master she had greatly meliorated my condition by giving me frequent allowances of meat and other necessaries. I believe she entertained some vague apprehensions that I might run away and betake myself to the woods for a living, but I do not think she ever suspected that I would hazard the untried undertaking of attempting to make my way back to Maryland. My purpose was fixed, and now nothing could shake it. I only waited for a proper season of the year to commence my toilsome and dangerous journey. As I must of necessity procure my own subsistence on my march, it behoved me to pay regard to the time at which I took it up. I furnished myself with a firebox, as it is called, that is, a tin case containing flints, steel, and tinder. This I considered indispensable. I took the great coat that my master had given me, and with a coarse needle and thread quilted a scabbard of old cloth in one side of it, in which I could put my sword and carry it with safety. I also procured a small bag of linen that held more than a peck. This bag I filled with the meal of parched corn, grinding the corn after it was parched in the woods where I worked at the mill at night. These operations, except the grinding of the corn, I carried on in a small conical cabin that I had built in the woods. The boots that my master gave me I had repaired by a Spaniard who lived in the neighborhood and followed the business of a cobbler. Before the first of August I had all my preparations completed, and had matured them with so much secrecy that no one in the country, white or black, suspected me of entertaining any extraordinary design. I only waited for the corn to be ripe and fit to be roasted, which time I had fixed as the period of my departure. I watched the progress of the corn daily, and on the 8th of August I perceived, on examining my mistress's field, that nearly half the ears were so far grown that by roasting them a man could easily subsist himself, and as I knew that this corn had been planted later than most of the corn in the country, I resolved to take leave of the plantation and its tenants for ever on the next day. I had a faithful dog, called True Man, and this poor animal had been my constant companion for more than four years, without ever showing cowardice or infidelity but once, and that was when the panther followed us from the woods. I was accordingly anxious to bring my dog with me, but as I knew the success of my undertaking depended on secrecy and silence, I thought it safest to abandon my last friend, and engage in my perilous enterprise alone. On the morning of the ninth I went to work as usual, carrying my dinner with me, and worked diligently at grubbing until about one o'clock in the day. I now sat down and took my last dinner as the slave of my mistress, dividing the contents of my basket with my dog. After I had finished, I tied my dog with a rope to a small tree. I set my gun against it, for I thought I should be better without the gun than with it, tied my knapsack with my bag of meal on my shoulders, and then turned to take a last farewell of my poor dog, that stood by the tree to which he was bound, looking wistfully at me. When I approached him, he licked my hands, and then rising on his hind feet and placing his forepaws on my breast, he uttered a long howl, which thrilled through my heart as if he had said, My master, do not leave me behind you. I now took to the forest, keeping as nearly as I could a north course all afternoon. Night overtook me before I reached any water course, or any other object worthy of being noticed, and I lay down and slept soundly without kindling a fire or eating anything. I was awake before day, and as soon as there was light enough to enable me to see my way, I resumed my journey and walked on, until about eight o'clock, when I came to a river, which I knew must be the Appalachie. I sat down on the bank of the river, opened my bag of meal, and made my breakfast of a part of its contents. I used my meal very sparingly, it being the most valuable treasure that I now possessed, 
though I had in my pocket three Spanish dollars, but in my situation this money could not avail me anything, as I was resolved not to show myself to any person, either white or black. After taking my breakfast I prepared to cross the river, which was here about a hundred yards wide, with a sluggish and deep current. The morning was sultry, and the thickets along the margin of the river teemed with insects and reptiles. By sounding the river with a pole I found the stream too deep to be waded, and I therefore prepared to swim it. For this purpose I stripped myself and bound my clothes on the top of my knapsack, and my bag of meal on the top of my clothes. Then, drawing my knapsack close up to my head, I threw myself into the river. In my youth I had learned to swim in the Patuxent, and have seldom met with any person who was more at ease in deep water than myself. I kept a straight line from the place of my entrance into the Appalachie to the opposite side, and when I had reached it, stepped upon the margin of the land, and turned round to view the place from which I had set out on my aquatic passage. But my eye was arrested by an object nearer to me than the opposite shore. Within twenty feet of me, in the very line that I had pursued crossing the river, a large alligator was moving, in full pursuit of me, with his nose just above the surface, in the position that creature takes when he gives chase to his intended prey in the water. The alligator can swim more than twice as fast as a man, for he can overtake young ducks on the water, and had I been ten seconds longer in the river, I should have been dragged to the bottom and never again been heard of. Seeing that I had gained the shore, my pursuer turned, made two or three circles in the water close by me, and then disappeared. I received this admonition as a warning of the dangers that I must encounter in my journey to the north. After adjusting my clothes, I again took to the woods, and bore a little to the east of north it now being my determination to turn down the country, so as to gain the line of the roads by which I had come to the south. I travelled all day in the woods, but a short time before sundown came within view of an opening in the forest, which I took to be cleared fields, but upon a closer examination, finding no fences or other enclosures around it, I advanced into it and found it to be an open savanna with a small stream of water creeping slowly through it. At the lower side of the open space were the remains of an old beaver dam, the central part of which had been broken away by the current of the stream at the time of some flood. Around the margin of this former pond I observed several decayed beaver lodges, and numerous stumps of small trees that had been cut down for the food or fortifications of this industrious little nation, which had fled at the approach of the white man, and all its people were now, like me, seeking refuge in the deepest solitudes of the forest, from the glance of every human eye. As it was growing late, and I believed I must now be near the settlements, I determined to encamp for the night beside this old beaver dam. I again took my supper from my bag of meal, and made my bed for the night amongst the canes that grew in the place. This night I slept but little, for it seemed as if all the owls in the country had assembled in my neighborhood to perform a grand musical concert. Their hooting and chattering commenced soon after dark, and continued until the dawn of day. In all parts of the southern country the owls are very numerous, especially along the margins of streams, and in the low grounds with which the waters are universally bordered but since I had been in the country, although I had passed many nights in the woods at all seasons of the year, I had never before heard so clamorous and deafening a chorus of nocturnal music. With the coming of the morning I arose from my couch, and proceeded warily along the woods, keeping a continual lookout for plantations, and listening attentively to every noise that I heard in the trees or amongst the cane brakes. When the sun had been up for two or three hours, I saw an appearance of blue sky at a distance through the trees, which proved that the forest had been removed from a spot somewhere before me, and at no great distance from me. And as I cautiously advanced I heard the voices of people in loud conversation. 
sitting down amongst the palmetto plants that grew around me in great numbers, I soon perceived that the people whose conversation I heard were coming nearer to me. I now heard the sound of horses' feet, and immediately afterwards saw two men on horseback, with rifles on their shoulders, riding through the woods and moving on a line that led them past me at a distance of about fifty or sixty yards. Perceiving that these men were equipped as hunters, I remained almost breathless for the purpose of hearing their conversation. When they came so near that I could distinguish their words, they were talking of the best place to take a stand for the purpose of seeing the deer, from which I inferred that they had sent men to some other point for the purpose of rousing the deer with dogs. After they had passed that point of their way that was nearest to me, and were beginning to recede from me, one of them asked the other if he had heard that a negro had run away the day before yesterday in Morgan County, to which his companion answered in the negative. The first then said he had seen an advertisement at the store which offered a hundred dollars reward for the runaway, whose name was Charles. The conversation of these horsemen was now interrupted by the cry of hounds, at a distance in the woods, and heightening the speed of their horses, they were soon out of my sight and hearing. Information of the state of the country through which I was travelling was of the highest value to me, and nothing could more nearly interest me than a knowledge of the fact that my flight was known to the white people who resided round about and before me. It was now necessary for me to become doubly vigilant, and to concert with myself measures of the highest moment. The first resolution that I took was that I would travel no more in the daytime. This was the season of hunting deer, and knowing that the hunters were under the necessity of being as silent as possible in the woods, I saw at a glance that they would be at least as likely to discover me in the forest before I could see them, as I should be to see them before I myself could be seen. I was now very hungry but exceedingly loath to make any further breaches on my bag of meal, except in extreme necessity. Feeling confident that there was a plantation within a few rods of me, I was anxious to have a view of it, in hope that I might find a cornfield upon it from which I could obtain a supply of roasting ears. Fearful to stand upright, I crept along through the low ground where I then was, at times raising myself to my knees for the purpose of obtaining a better view of things about me. In this way I advanced until I came in view of a high fence, and beyond this saw cotton, tall and flourishing, but no sign of corn. I crept up close to the fence, where I found the trunk of a large tree that had been felled in clearing the field. Standing upon this, and looking over the plantation, I saw the tassels of corn, at the distance of half a mile, growing in a field which was bordered on one side by the wood in which I stood. It was now nine or ten o'clock in the morning, and as I had slept but little the night before, I crept into the bushes, great numbers of which grew in and about the top of the fallen tree, and hungry as I was, fell asleep. When I awoke, it appeared to me from the position of the sun, which I had carefully noted before I lay down, to be about one or two o'clock. As this was the time of the day when the heat is most oppressive, and when every one was most likely to be absent from the forest, I again moved, and taking a circuitous route at some distance from the fields, reached the fence opposite the cornfield without having met anything to alarm me. Having cautiously examined everything around me, as well by the eye as by the ear, and finding all quiet, I ventured to cross the fence and pluck from the standing stalks about a dozen good ears of corn, with which I stole back to the thicket in safety. This corn was of no use to me without the fire to roast it, and it was equally dangerous to kindle fire by night as by day the light at one time and the smoke at another might betray me to those who i knew were ever ready to pursue and arrest me hunger eats through stone walls says the proverb and an empty stomach is a petitioner whose solicitations cannot be refused if there is anything to satisfy them with having regained the woods in safety i ventured to go as far as the side of a swamp 
which I knew to be at the distance of two or three hundred yards by the appearance of the timber. When in the swamp I felt pretty secure, but determined that I would never again attempt to travel in the neighborhood of a plantation in the daytime. When in the swamp a quarter of a mile, I collected some dry wood, and lighted it with the aid of my tinder-box, flint, and steel. This was the first fire that I kindled on my journey, and I was careful to burn none but dry wood to prevent the formation of smoke. Here I roasted my corn, and ate as much of it as I could. After my dinner I lay down and slept for three or four hours. When I awoke, the sun was scarcely visible through the treetops. It was evening, and prudence required me to leave the swamp before dark, lest I should not be able to find my way out. Approaching the edge of the swamp, I watched the going down of the sun, and noted the stars as they appeared in the heavens. I had long since learned to distinguish the North Star from all the other small luminaries of the night, and the seven pointers were familiar to me. These heavenly bodies were all the guides I had to direct me on my way, and as soon as the night had set in, I commenced my march through the woods, bearing as nearly due east as I could. I took this course for the purpose of getting down the country as far as the road leading from Augusta to Morgan County, with the intention of pursuing the route by which I had come out from South Carolina, deeming it more safe to travel the high road by night than to attempt to make my way at random over the country, guided only by the stars. I traveled all night, keeping the North Star on my left hand as nearly as I could, and passing many plantations, taking care to keep at a great distance from the houses. I think I traveled at least twenty-five miles to-night without passing any road that appeared so wide, or so much beaten, as that which I had traveled when I came from South Carolina. This night I passed through a peach orchard, laden with fine ripe fruit, with which I filled my pockets and hat, and before day, in crossing a cornfield, I pulled a supply of roasting ears, with which, and my peaches, I retired at break of day to a large wood, into which I travelled more than a mile before I halted. Here, in the midst of a thicket of high whortleberry bushes, I encamped for the day. I made my breakfast upon roasted corn and peaches, and then lay down and slept, unmolested, until after twelve o'clock, when I awoke and rose up for the purpose of taking a better view of my quarters. But I was scarcely on my feet when I was attacked by a swarm of hornets that issued from a large nest that hung on the limb of a tree within twenty or thirty feet of me. I knew that the best means of making peace with my hostile neighbors was to lie down with my face to the ground, and this attitude I quickly took, not, however, before I had been stung by several of my assailants, which kept humming through the air about me for a long time, and prevented me from leaving this spot until after sundown, after they had retired to rest for the night. I now commenced the attack on my part, and taking a handful of dry leaves, approached the nest, which was full as large as a half-bushel, and thrusting the leaves into the hole at the bottom of the nest, through which its tenants passed in and out, secured the whole garrison prisoners in their own citadel. I now cut off the branch upon which the nest hung, and threw it with its contents into my evening fire, over which I roasted a supply of corn for my night's journey. Commencing my march this evening, soon after nightfall, I travelled until about one o'clock in the morning, as nearly as I could estimate the time by the appearance of the stars, when I came upon a road, which, from its width and beaten appearance, seemed to be the road to Morgan County. After travelling for a day or two near this road, I at last found myself at daybreak one morning in sight of the home of my late master's friend, spoken of in our journey to Savannah. I was desperately hungry, and the idea swayed me to throw myself upon his generosity and beg for food. It seemed to me that this gentleman was too benevolent a man to arrest and send me back to my cruel mistress, and yet how could I expect or even hope 
that a cotton planter would see a runaway slave on his premises and not cause him to be taken up and sent home failing to seize a runaway slave when he has him in his power is held to be one of the most dishonorable acts to which a southern planter can subject himself nor should the people of the north be surprised at this slaves are regarded in the south as the most precious of all earthly possessions and at the same time as a precarious and hazardous kind of property in the enjoyment of which the master is not safe the planters may well be compared to the inhabitants of a national frontier which is exposed to the inroads of hostile invading tribes where all are in like danger and subject to like fears it is expected that all will be governed by like sentiments and act upon like principles i stood and looked at the house of this good planter for more than an hour after the sun had risen and saw all the movements which usually take place on a cotton plantation in the morning long before the sun was up the overseer had proceeded to the field at the head of the hands the black women who attended to the cattle and milked the cows had gone to the cowpen with their pails and the smoke ascended from the chimney of the kitchen before the doors of the great house were opened or any of the members of the family were seen abroad at length two young ladies opened the door and stood in the freshness of the morning air these were soon joined by a brother and at last i saw the gentleman himself leave the house and walk toward the stables that stood at some distance from the house on my left i think even now that it was a foolish resolution that emboldened me to show myself to this gentleman it was like throwing oneself in the way of a lion who is known sometimes to spare those whom he might destroy but i resolved to go and meet this planter at his stables and tell him my whole story issuing from the woods i crossed the fields unperceived by the people at the house and going directly to the stables presented myself to their proprietor as he stood looking at a fine horse in one of the yards at first he did not know me and asked me whose man i was i then asked him if he did not remember me and named the time when i had been at his house i then told at once that i was a runaway that my master was dead and my mistress so cruel that i could not live with her not omitting to show the scars on my back and to give a full account of the manner in which they had been made the gentleman stood and looked at me more than a minute without uttering a word and then said i will not betray you but you must not stay here it must not be known that you were on this plantation or that i saw and conversed with you however as i suppose you are hungry you may go to the kitchen and get your breakfast with my house servants he then set off for the house and i followed but turning into the kitchen as he ordered me i was soon supplied with a good breakfast of cold meat warm bread and as much new buttermilk as i chose to drink before i sat down to breakfast the lady of the house came into the kitchen with her two daughters and gave me a dram of peach brandy i drank this brandy and was very thankful for it but i am fully convinced now that it did me much more harm than good and that this part of the kindness of this most excellent family was altogether misplaced whilst i was taking my breakfast a black man came into the kitchen and gave me a dollar that he said his master had sent me at the same time laying on the table before me a package of bread and meat weighing at least ten pounds wrapped up in a cloth on delivering these things the black man told me that his master desired me to quit his premises as soon as i finished my breakfast this injunction i obeyed and within less than an hour after i entered this truly hospitable house i quitted it forever but not without leaving behind me my holiest blessings upon the heads of its inhabitants it was yet early in the morning when i regained the woods on the opposite side of the plantation from that by which i had entered it End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of fifty years in chains or the life of an american slave this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 16 I could not believe it possible that the white people whom I had just left would give information of the route I had taken. But as it was possible that all who dwelt on this plantation might not be so pure of heart as were they who possessed it, I thought it prudent to travel some distance in the woods before I stopped for the day, notwithstanding the risk of moving about in the open light. For the purpose of precluding the possibility of being betrayed, I now determined to quit this road, and travel altogether in the woods or through open fields, for two or three nights, guiding my march by the stars. In pursuance of this resolution, I bore away to the left of the high road, and travelled five or six miles before I stopped, going round all the fields that I saw in my way, and keeping them at a good distance from me. In the afternoon of this day it rained, and I had no other shelter than the boughs and leaves of a large magnolia tree. But this kept me tolerably dry, and as it cleared away in the evening I was able to continue my journey by starlight. I have no definite idea of the distance that I travelled in the course of this and the two succeeding nights, as I had no road to guide me, and was much perplexed by the plantations and houses, the latter of which I most carefully eschewed. But on the third night after this I encountered a danger which was very nearly fatal to me. At the time of which I now speak, the moon having changed lately, shone until about eleven o'clock. I had been on my way two or three hours this evening, and all the world seemed to be quiet, when I entered a plantation that lay quite across my way. In passing through these fields I at last saw the houses and other improvements, and about a hundred yards from the house a peach orchard, which I could distinguish by the faint light of the moon. This orchard was but a little out of my way and a quarter of a mile, as nearly as I could judge, from the woods. I resolved to examine these peach-trees, and see what fruit was on them. Coming amongst them I found the fruit of the kind called Indian peaches in Georgia. These Indian peaches are much the largest and finest peaches that I have ever seen, one of them oftentimes being as large as a common quince. I had filled all my pockets, and was filling my handkerchief with this delicious fruit, which is of deep red, when I heard the loud growl of a dog, toward the house the roof of which I could see. I stood as still as a stone, but yet the dog growled on, and at length barked out. I presume he smelled me, for he could not hear me. In a short time I found that the dog was coming towards me and then I started and ran as fast as I could for the woods. He now barked louder, and was followed by another dog, both making a terrible noise. I was then pretty light of foot, and was already close by the woods, when the first dog overtook me. I carried a good stick in my hand, and with this I kept the dogs at bay until I gained the fence and escaped into the woods. But now I heard the shouts of men encouraging the dogs, both of which were now up with me, and the men were coming as fast as they could. The dogs would not permit me to run, and unless I could make free use of my heels, it was clear that I must be taken in a few minutes. I now thought of my master's sword, which I had not removed from its quilted scabbard in my greatcoat since I commenced my journey. I snatched it from its sheath, and at a single cut laid open the head of the largest and fiercest of the dogs, from his neck to his nose. He gave a loud yell and fell dead on the ground. The other dog, seeing the fate of his companion, leaped the fence and escaped into the field, where he stopped, and, like a cowardly cur, set up a clamorous barking at the enemy he was afraid to look in the face. I thought this no time to wait to ascertain what the men would say when they came to their dead dog but made the best of my way through the woods, and did not stop to look behind me for more than an hour. 
In my battle with the dogs I lost all my peaches, except a few that remained in my pockets, and in running through the woods I tore my clothes very badly, a disaster not easily repaired in my situation. But I had proved the solidity of my own judgment in putting up my sword as a part of my travelling equipage. I now considered it necessary to travel as fast as possible, and get as far as I could before day from the late battleground, and certainly I lost no time. But from the occurrences of the next day I am of opinion that I had not continued in a straight line all night, but that I must have travelled in a circular or zigzag route. When a man is greatly alarmed and in a strange country, he is not able to note courses or calculate distances very accurately. Daybreak made its appearance when I was moving to the south, for the daybreak was on my left hand. But I immediately stopped, went into a thicket of low white oak bushes, and lay down to rest myself, for I was very weary, and soon fell asleep, and did not wake until it was ten or eleven o'clock. Before I fell asleep I noted the course of the rising sun from the place where I lay, in pursuance of a rule that I had established, for by this means I could tell the time of day at any hour within a short period of time, by taking the bearing of the sun in the heavens from where I lay, and then comparing it with the place of his rising. When I awoke to-day I felt hungry, and after eating my breakfast again lay down, but felt an unusual sense of disquietude and alarm. It seemed to me that this was not a safe place to lie in, although it looked as well as any other spot that I could see. I rose and looked for a more secure retreat, but not seeing any, lay down again. Still I was uneasy and could not lie still. Finally I determined to get up and remove to the side of a large and long black log that lay at a distance of seventy or eighty yards from me. I went to the log and lay down by it, placing my bundle under my head, with the intention of going to sleep again if I could. But I had not been here more than fifteen or twenty minutes when I heard the noise of men's voices, and soon after the tramping of horses on the ground. I lay with my back to the log, in such a position that I could see the place where I had been in the bushes. I saw two dogs go into this little thicket, and three horsemen rode over the very spot where I had lain when asleep in the morning. And immediately horses and voices were at my back, around me, and over me. Two horses jumped over the log by the side of which I lay, one about ten feet from my feet and the other within two yards from my head. The horses both saw me, took fright, and started to run. But fortunately their riders, who were probably looking for me in the tops of the trees, or expecting to see me start before them in the woods and run for my life, did not see me, and attributed the alarm of their horses to the black appearance of the log. For I heard one of them say, our horses are afraid of black logs. I wonder how they would stand the sight of the negro if we should meet him. There must have been in the troop at least twenty horsemen, and the number of dogs was greater than I could count as they ran in the woods. I knew that all these men and dogs were in search of me, and that if they could find me I should be hunted down like a wild beast. The dogs that had gone into the thicket where I had been, fortunately for me, had not been trained to hunt negroes in the woods, and were probably brought out for the purpose of being trained. Doubtless if some of the kept dogs, as they are called, of which there were certainly several in this large pack, had happened to go into that thicket instead of those that did go there, my race would soon have been run. I lay still by the side of the log for a long time after the horses, dogs, and men had ceased to trouble the woods with their noise. If it can be said that a man lies still, who is trembling in every joint, nerve, and muscle, like a dog lying upon a cake of ice. And when I arose and turned round I found myself so completely bereft of understanding that I could not tell south from north nor east from west. I could not even distinguish the thicket of bushes from which I had removed to come to this place from the other bushes of the woods. 
and at night it appeared to me that the sun set in the southeast. After sundown the moon appeared to my distempered judgment to stand due north from me, and all of the stars were out of their places. Fortunately I had sense enough remaining to know that it would not be safe for me to attempt to travel until my brain had been restored to its ordinary stability, which did not take place until the third morning after my fright. The three days that I passed in this place I reckon the most unhappy of my life, for surely it is the height of human misery to be oppressed with alienation of mind and to be conscious of the affliction. Distracted as I was, I had determined never to quit this wood and voluntarily return to slavery, and the joy I felt on the third morning, when I saw the sun rise in his proper place in the heavens, the black log, the thicket of bushes, and all other things resume the positions in which I found them, may be imagined by those who have been saved from apparently hopeless shipwreck on a barren rock in the midst of the ocean, but cannot be described by any but a poetic pen. I spent this day in making short excursions through the woods, for the purpose of ascertaining whether any road was near to me or not and in the afternoon I came to one about a mile from my camp, which was broad and had the appearance of being much travelled. It appeared to me to lead to the north. A while before sundown I brought my bundle to this road, and lay down quietly to await the approach of night. When it was quite dark, except the light of the moon, which was now brilliant, I took to this road and travelled all night without hearing or seeing any person and on the succeeding night, about two o'clock in the morning, I came to the margin of a river so wide that I could not see across it, but the fog was so dense at this time that I could not have seen across a river of very moderate width. I procured a long pole and sounded the depth of the water, which I found not very deep, but as I could not see the opposite shore, was afraid to attempt to ford the stream. In this dilemma I turned back from the river, and went more than a mile to gain the covert of a small wood, where I might pass the day in safety, and wait a favourable moment for obtaining a view of the river preparatory to crossing it. I lay all day in full view of the high road, and saw at least a hundred people pass, from which I inferred that the country was populous about me. In the evening, as soon as it was dark, I left my retreat and returned to the riverside. The atmosphere was now clear, and the river seemed to be at least a quarter of a mile in width. And whilst I was divesting myself of my clothes, preparatory to entering the water, happening to look down the shore, I saw a canoe, with its head drawn high on the beach. On reaching the canoe, I found that it was secured to the trunk of a tree by a lock and chain, but after many efforts I broke the lock and launched the canoe into the river. The paddles had been removed, but with the aid of my sounding pole I managed to conduct the canoe across the water. I was now once more in South Carolina, where I knew it was necessary for me to be even more watchful than I had been in Georgia. I do not know where I crossed the Savannah River, but I think it must have been only a few miles above the town of Augusta. After gaining the Carolina shore, I took an observation of the rising moon and of such stars as I was acquainted with, and hastened to get away from the river, from which I knew that heavy fogs rose every night at this season of the year, obscuring the heavens for many miles on either side. I travelled this night at least twenty miles, and provided myself with a supply of corn, which was now hard, from a field at the side of the road. At daybreak I turned into the woods, and went to the top of a hill on my left, where the ground was overgrown by the species of pine-tree called spruce in the south. I here kindled a fire, and parched corn for my breakfast. In the afternoon of this day the weather became cloudy, and before dark the rain fell copiously, and continued through the night with the wind high. I took shelter under a large stooping tree that was decayed and hollow on the lower side, and kept me dry until morning. 
when daylight appeared i could see that the country around me was well inhabited and that the forest in which i lay was surrounded by plantations at the distance of one or two miles from me i did not consider this a safe position and waited anxiously for night to enable me to change my quarters the weather was foul throughout the day and when night returned it was so dark that i could not see a large tree three feet before me waiting until the moon rose i made my way back to the road but had not proceeded more than two or three miles on my way when i came to a place where the road forked and the two roads led away almost at right angles from each other it was so cloudy that i could not see the place of the moon in the heavens and i knew not which of these roads to take to go wrong was worse than to stand still and i therefore determined to look out for some spot in which i could hide myself and remain in this neighborhood until the clearing up of the weather taking the right-hand road i followed its course until i saw at a distance as i computed it in the night of two miles from me a large forest which covered elevated ground i gained it by the shortest route across some cotton fields going several hundred yards into this wood i attempted to kindle a fire in which i failed every combustible substance being wet this compelled me to pass the night as well as i could amongst the damp bushes and trees that overhung me when day came i went farther into the woods and on the top of the highest ground that i could see established my camp by cutting bushes with my knife and erecting a sort of rude booth it was now by my computation about the twenty fifth of august and i remained here eleven days without seeing one clear night and in all this time the sun never shone for half a day at once i procured my subsistence while here from a field of corn which i discovered at the distance of a mile and a half from my camp this was the first time that i was weather bound and my patience had been worn out and renewed repeatedly before the return of the clear weather but one afternoon i perceived the trees to be much agitated by the wind the clouds appeared high and were driven with velocity over my head i saw the clear sky appear in all its beauty in the northwest before sundown the wind was high and the sun shone in full splendor and a few fleecy clouds careering high in the upper vault of heaven gave assurance that the rains were over and gone at nightfall i returned to the forks of the road and after much observation finally concluded to follow the right-hand road in which i am satisfied that i committed a great error nothing worthy of notice occurred for several days after this as i was now in a thickly peopled country i never moved until long after night and was cautious never to permit daylight to find me on the road but i observed that the north star was always on my left hand my object was to reach the neighborhood of columbia and get upon the road which i had traveled and seen years before in coming to the south but the road i was on now must have been the great charleston road leading down the country and not across the courses of the rivers so many people traveled this road as well by night as by day that my progress was very slow and in some of the nights i did not travel more than eight miles at the end of a week after leaving the forks i found myself in a flat sandy poor country and as i had not met with any river on this road i now concluded that i was on the way to the seaboard instead of columbia in my perplexity i resolved to try to get information concerning the country i was in by placing myself in some obscure place on the side of the road and listening to the conversation of travellers as they passed me for this purpose i chose the corner of a cotton field around which the road turned and led along the fence for some distance passing the day in the woods among the pine trees i came to this corner in the evening and lying down within the field waited patiently the coming of travellers that i might hear their conversation and endeavour to learn from that which they said the name of at least some place in this neighbourhood 
On the first and second evenings that I lay here, I gleaned nothing from the passengers that I thought could be of service to me. But on the third night, about ten o'clock, several wagons drawn by mules passed me, and I heard one of the drivers call to another and tell him that it was sixty miles to Charleston, and that they should be able to reach the river to-morrow. I could not at first imagine what river this could be, but another of the wagoners inquired how far it was to the Edisto, to which it was replied by some one that it was near thirty miles. I now perceived that I had mistaken my course, and was as completely lost as a wild goose in cloudy weather. Not knowing what to do, I retraced the road that had led me to this place for several nights, hoping that something would happen from which I might learn the route to Columbia, but I gained no information that could avail me anything. At length I determined to quit this road altogether, travel by the North Star for two or three weeks, and after that trust to Providence to guide me to some road that might lead me back to Maryland. Having turned my face due north, I made my way pretty well for the first night, but on the second the fog was so dense that no stars could be seen. This compelled me to remain in my camp, which I had pitched in a swamp. In this place I remained more than a week, waiting for clear nights. But now the equinoctial storm came on, and raged with a fury which I had never before witnessed in this annual gale. At least it had never before appeared so violent to me, because perhaps I had never been exposed to its blasts without the shelter of a house of some kind. This storm continued four days, and no wolf ever lay closer in his lair or moved out with more stealthy caution than I did during this time. My subsistence was drawn from a small cornfield at the edge of the swamp in which I lay. After the storm was over, the weather became calm and clear, and I fell into a road which appeared to run nearly northwest. Following the course of this road by short marches, because I was obliged to start late at night and stop before day, I came on the first day, or rather night, of October, by my calendar, to a broad and well-frequented road that crossed mine at nearly right angles. These roads crossed in the middle of a plantation, and I took to the right hand along this great road, and pursued it in the same cautious and slow manner that I had travelled for the last month. When the day came, I took refuge in the woods as usual, choosing the highest piece of ground that I could find in the neighbourhood. No part of this country was very high, but I thought people who visited these woods would be less inclined to walk to the tops of the hills than to keep their course along the low grounds. I had lately crossed many small streams, but on the second night of my journey on this road came to a narrow but deep river, and after the most careful search no boat or craft of any kind could be found on my side. A large flat with two or three canoes lay on the opposite side, but they were as much out of my reach as if they had never been made. There was no alternative but swimming this stream, and I made the transit in less than three minutes, carrying my packages on my back. I had as yet fallen in with no considerable towns, and whenever I had seen a house near the road, or one of the small hamlets of the south in my way, I had gone round by the woods or fields, so as to avoid the inhabitants. But on the fourth night after swimming the small river, I came in sight of a considerable village, with lights burning and shining in many of the windows. I knew the danger of passing a town, on account of the patrols with which all southern towns are provided, and making a long circuit to the right, so as totally to avoid this village, I came to the banks of a broad river, which, upon further examination, I found flowing past the village and near its border. This compelled me to go back and attempt to turn the village on the left, which was performed by wandering a long time in swamps and pine woods. It was break of day when I regained the road beyond the village, and returning to the swamps from which I had first issued, I passed the day under their cover. 
on the following night after regaining the road i soon found myself in a country almost entirely clear of timber and abounding in fields of cotton and corn the houses were numerous and the barking of dogs was incessant i felt that i was in the midst of dangers and that i was entering a region very different from those tracts of country through which i had lately passed where the gloom of the wilderness was only broken by solitary plantations or lonely huts i had no doubt that i was in the neighborhood of some town but of its name and the part of the country in which it was located i was ignorant i at length found that i was receding from the woods altogether and entering a champagne country in the midst of which i now perceived a town of considerable magnitude the inhabitants of which were entirely silent and the town itself presented the appearance of total solitude the country around was so open that i despaired of turning so large a place as this was and again finding the road i travelled i therefore determined to risk all consequences and attempt to pass this town under cover of darkness keeping straight forward i came unexpectedly to a broad river which i now saw running between me and the town i took it for granted that there must be a ferry at this place and on examining the shore found several small boats fastened only with ropes to a large scow one of these boats i seized and was quickly on the opposite shore of the river i entered the village and proceeded to its centre without seeing so much as a rat in motion finding myself in an open space i stopped to examine the streets and upon looking at the houses around me i at once recognized the jail of columbia and the tavern in which i had lodged on the night after i was sold this discovery made me feel almost at home with my wife and children i remembered the streets by which i had come from the country to the jail and was quickly at the extremity of the town marching towards the residence of the paltry planter at whose house i had lodged on my way south it was late at night when i left columbia and it was necessary for me to make all speed and get as far as possible from that place before day i ran rather than walked until the appearance of dawn when i left the road and took shelter in the pine woods with which this part of the country abounds i had now been travelling almost two months and was still so near the place from which i first departed that i could easily have walked to it in a week by daylight but i hoped that as i was now on a road with which i was acquainted and in a country through which i had travelled before that my future progress would be more rapid and that i should be able to surmount without difficulty many of the obstacles that had hitherto embarrassed me so greatly it was now in my power to avail myself of the knowledge i had formerly acquired of the customs of south carolina the patrol are very rigid in the execution of the authority with which they are invested but i never had much difficulty with these officers anywhere from dark until ten or eleven o'clock at night the patrol are watchful and always traversing the country in quest of negroes but towards midnight these gentlemen grow cold or sleepy or weary and generally betake themselves to some house where they can procure a comfortable fire i now established as a rule of my future conduct to remain in my hiding-place until after ten o'clock according to my computation of time and this night i did not come to the road until i supposed it to be within an hour of midnight and it was well for me that i practised so much caution for when within two or three hundred yards of the road i heard people conversing after standing some minutes in the woods and listening to the voices at the road the people separated and a party took each end of the road and galloped away upon their horses these people were certainly a band of patrollers who were watching this road and had just separated to return home for the night after the horsemen were quite out of hearing i came to the road and walked as fast as i could for hours and again came into the lane leading to the house where i had first remained a few days in carolina 
Turning away from the road, I passed through this plantation, near the old cotton-gin house in which I had formerly lodged, and perceived that everything on this plantation was nearly as it was when I left it. Two or three miles from this place I again left the road, and sought a place of concealment, and from this time until I reached Maryland I never remained in the road until daylight but once, and I paid dearly then for my temerity. I was now in an open, thickly peopled country, in comparison with many other tracts through which I had passed, and this circumstance compelled me to observe the greater caution. As nearly as possible, I confined my travelling within the hours of midnight and three o'clock in the morning. Parties of patrollers were heard by me almost every morning before day. These people sometimes moved directly along the roads, but more frequently lay in wait near the side of the road, ready to pounce upon any runaway slave that might chance to pass. But I knew by former experience that they never lay out all night, except in times of apprehended danger, and the country appearing at this time to be quiet, I felt but little apprehension of falling in with these policemen within my travelling hours. There was now plenty of corn in the fields, and sweet potatoes had not yet been dug. There was no scarcity of provisions with me, and my health was good, and my strength unimpaired. For more than two weeks I pursued the road that had led me from Columbia, believing I was on my way to Camden. Many small streams crossed my way, but none of them were large enough to oblige me to swim in crossing them. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 17 On the 24th of October, according to my computation, in a dark night I came to a river which appeared to be both broad and deep. Sounding its depth with a pole, I found it too deep to be forded, and after the most careful search along the shore, no boat could be discovered. This place appeared altogether strange to me, and I began to fear that I was again lost. Confident that I had never before been where I now found myself, and ignorant of the other side of the stream, I thought it best not to attempt to cross this water until I was better informed of the country through which it flowed. A thick wood bordered the road on my left, and gave me shelter until daylight. Ascending a tree at sunrise that overlooked the stream, which appeared to be more than a mile in width, I perceived on the opposite shore a house, and one large and several small boats in the river. I remained in this tree the greater part of the day, and saw several persons cross the river, some of whom had horses, but in the evening the boats were all taken back to the place at which I had seen them in the morning. The river was so broad that I felt some fear of failing in the attempt to swim it, but seeing no prospect of procuring a boat to transport me, I resolved to attempt the navigation as soon as it was dark. About nine o'clock at night, having equipped myself in the best manner I was able, I undertook this hazardous navigation, and succeeded in gaining the farther shore of the river in about an hour, with all my things in safety. On the previous day I had noted the bearing of the road as it led from the river, and in the middle of the night I again resumed my journey, in a state of perplexity bordering upon desperation, for it was now evident that this was not the road by which we had travelled when we came to the southern country, and on which hand to turn to reach the right way I knew not. After travelling five or six miles on this road, and having the North Star in view all the time, 
I became satisfied that my course lay northwest, and that I was consequently going out of my way. And to heighten my anxiety, I had not tasted any animal food since I crossed the Savannah River. A sensation of hunger harassed me constantly. But fortune, which had been so long adverse to me, and had led me so often astray, had now a little favor in store for me. The leaves were already fallen from some of the more tender trees, and near the road this night I perceived a persimmon tree, well laden with fruit, and whilst gathering the fallen persimmons under the tree, a noise overhead arrested my attention. This noise was caused by a large opossum, which was on the tree gathering fruit like myself. With a long stick the animal was brought to the ground, and it proved to be very fat, weighing at least ten pounds. With such a luxury as this in my possession, I could not think of travelling far without tasting it, and accordingly halted about a mile from the persimmon tree, on a rising ground in a thick wood, where I killed my opossum and took off its skin, a circumstance that I much regretted, for with the skin I took at least a pound of fine fat. Had I possessed the means of scalding my game and dressing it like a pig, it would have afforded me provision for a week. But as it was, I made a large fire and roasted my prize before it, losing all the oil that ran out in the operation for want of a dripping pan to catch it. It was daylight when my meat was ready for the table, and a very sumptuous breakfast it yielded me. Since leaving Columbia, I had followed as nearly as the course of the roads permitted the index of the North Star, which I supposed would lead me on the most direct route to Maryland. But I now became convinced that this star was leading me away from the line by which I had approached the cotton country. I slept none this day, but passed the whole time, from breakfast until night, in considering the means of regaining my lost way. From the aspect of the country I arrived at the conclusion that I was not near the sea-coast, for there were no swamps at all in this region. The land lay rather high and rolling, and oak timber abounded. At the return of night I resumed my journey earlier than usual, paying no regard to the roads, but keeping the North Star on my left hand as nearly as I could. This night I killed a rabbit, which had leaped from the bushes before me, by throwing my walking-stick at it. It was roasted at my stopping-place in the morning, and was very good. I pursued the same course, keeping the North Star on my left hand for three nights, intending to get as far east as the road leading from Columbia to Richmond in Virginia. But as my line of march lay almost continually in the woods, I made but little progress, and on the third day the weather became cloudy so that I could not see the stars. This again compelled me to lie by until the return of fair weather. On the second day, after I had stopped this time, the sun shone out bright in the morning, and continued to shed a glorious light during the day. But in the evening the heavens became overcast with clouds, and the night that followed was so dark that I did not attempt to travel. This state of the weather continued more than a week, obliging me to remain stationary all this time. These cloudy nights were succeeded by a brisk wind from the northwest, accompanied by fine clear nights, in which I made the best of my way towards the northeast, pursuing my course across the country, without regard to roads, forests, or streams of water, crossing many of the latter, none of which were deep, but some of them were extremely muddy. One night I became entangled in a thick and deep swamp, the trees that grew in which were so tall and stood so close together that the interlocking of their boughs and the deep foliage in which they were clad prevented me from seeing the stars. Wandering there for several hours, most of the time with mud and water over my knees, and frequently wading in stagnant pools with deep slimy bottoms, I became totally lost and was incapable of seeing the least appearance of fast land. At length, giving up all hope of extricating myself from this abyss of mud, water, brambles, and fallen timber, I scrambled on a large tussock, and sat down to await the coming of day. 
with the intention of going to the nearest high land as soon as the sun should be up. The nights were now becoming cool, and though I did not see any frost in the swamp where I was in the morning, I have no doubt that hoar-frost was seen in the dry and open country. After daylight I found myself as much perplexed as I was at midnight. No shore was to be seen, and in every direction there was the same deep, dreary, black solitude. To add to my misfortune, the morning proved cloudy, and when the sun was up I could not tell the east from the west. After waiting several hours for a sight of the sun, and failing to obtain it, I set out in search of a running stream of water, intending to strike off at right angles with the course of the current, and endeavor to reach the dry ground by this means. But after wandering about, through tangled bushes, briars, and vines, clambering over fallen tree-tops, and wading through fens overgrown with sawgrass, for two or three hours, I sat down in despair of finding any guide to conduct me from this detestable place. My bag of meal that I took with me at the commencement of my journey was long since gone, and the only provisions that I now possessed were a few grains of parched corn, and near a pint of chestnuts that I had picked up under a tree the day before I entered the swamp. The chestnut tree was full of nuts, but I was afraid to throw sticks or to shake the tree, lest hunters or other persons hearing the noise might be drawn to the place. About ten o'clock I sat down under a large cypress tree, upon a decaying log of the same timber, to make my breakfast on a few grains of parched corn. Near me was an open space without trees, but filled with water that seemed to be deep, for no grass grew in it, except a small quantity near the shore. The water was on my left hand, and as I sat cracking my corn, my attention was attracted by the playful gambols of two squirrels that were running and chasing each other on the boughs of some trees near me. Half pleased with the joyous movements of the little animals, and half covetous of their carcasses to roast and devour them, I paid no attention to a succession of sounds on my left, which I thought proceeded from the movement of frogs at the edge of the water, until the breaking of a stick near me caused me to turn my head, when I discovered that I had other neighbors than spring frogs. A monstrous alligator had left the water and was crawling over the mud with his eyes fixed upon me. He was now within fifteen feet of me, and in a moment more, if he had not broken the stick with his weight, I should have become his prey. He could easily have knocked me down with a blow of his tail, and if his jaws had once been closed on a leg or an arm, he would have dragged me into the water, spite of any resistance that I could have made. At the sight of him I sprang to my feet, and running to the other end of the fallen tree on which I sat, and being there out of danger, had an opportunity of viewing the motions of the alligator at leisure. Finding me out of his reach, he raised his trunk from the ground, elevated his snout, and gave a wistful look, the import of which I well understood. Then, turning slowly round, he retreated to the water, and sank from my vision. I was much alarmed by this adventure with the alligator, for had I fallen in with this huge reptile in the night-time, I should have had no chance of escape from his tusks. The whole day was spent in the swamp, not in travelling from place to place, but in waiting for the sun to shine, to enable me to obtain a knowledge of the various points of the heavens. The day was succeeded by a night of unbroken darkness, and it was late in the evening of the second day before I saw the sun. It being then too late to attempt to extricate myself from the swamp for that day, I was obliged to pass another night in the lodge that I had formed for myself in the thick boughs of a fallen cypress tree, which elevated me several feet from the ground, where I believed the alligator could not reach me if he should come in pursuit of me. On the morning of the third day the sun rose beautifully clear, and at sight of him I set off for the east. It must have been five miles from the place where I lay to the dry land on the east of the swamp, for with all the exertion that fear and hunger compelled me to make, it was two or three o'clock in the afternoon when I reached the shore, after swimming in several places, 
and suffering the loss of a very valuable part of my clothes, which were torn off by the briars and snags. On coming to high ground I found myself in the woods, and hungry as I was, lay down to await the coming of night, lest someone should see me moving through the forest in daylight. When night came on I resumed my journey by the stars, which were visible, and marched several miles before coming to a plantation. The first that I came to was a cotton field, and after much search I found no corn nor grain of any kind on this place, and was compelled to continue on my way. Two or three miles further on I was more fortunate, and found a field of corn which had been gathered from the stalks and thrown in heaps along the ground. Filling my little bag, which I still kept, with this corn, I retreated a mile or two in the woods, and striking fire, encamped for the purpose of parching and eating it. After dispatching my meal, I lay down beside the fire, and fell into a sound sleep, from which I did not awake until long after sunrise. But on rising and looking around me, I found that my lodge was within less than a hundred yards of a new house that people were building in the woods, and upon which men were now at work. Dropping instantly to the ground, I crawled away through the woods, until, being out of sight of the house, I ventured to rise and escape on my feet. After I lay down in the night, my fire had died away, and emitted no smoke. This circumstance had saved me. This affair made me more cautious as to my future conduct. Hiding in the woods until night again came on, I continued my course eastward, and some time after midnight came upon a wide, well-beaten road, one end of which led, at this place, a little to the left of the North Star, which I could plainly see. Here I deliberated a long time, whether to take this road, or continue my course across the country by the stars, but at last resolved to follow the road, more from a desire to get out of the woods than from a conviction that it would lead me in the right way. In the course of this night I saw but few plantations, but was so fortunate as to see a groundhog crossing the road before me. This animal I killed with my stick, and carried it until morning. At the approach of daylight, turning away to the right, I gained the top of an eminence from which I could see through the woods for some distance around me. Here I kindled a fire and roasted my groundhog, which afforded me a most grateful repast after my late fasting and severe toils. According to custom, my meal being over, I betook myself to sleep, and did not awake until the afternoon, when descending a few rods down the hill, and standing still to take a survey of the woods around me, I saw, at the distance of half a mile from me, a man moving about in the forest, and apparently watching like myself to see if any one was in view. Looking at this man attentively, I saw that he was a black, and that he did not move more than a few rods from the same spot where I first saw him. Curiosity impelled me to know more of the condition of my neighbor, and descending quite to the foot of the hill, I perceived that he had a covert of boughs of trees, under which I saw him pass, and after some time return again from his retreat. Examining the appearance of things carefully, I became satisfied that the stranger was, like myself, a negro slave, and I determined without more ceremony to go and speak to him for I felt no fear of being betrayed by one as badly off in the world as myself. When this man first saw me, at the distance of a hundred yards from him, he manifested great agitation, and at once seemed disposed to run from me. But when I called to him, and told him not to be afraid, he became more assured, and waited for me to come close to him. I found him to be a dark mulatto, small and slender in person, and lame in one leg. He had been well-bred, and possessed good manners and fine address. I told him I was travelling, and presumed this was not his dwelling-place, upon which he informed me that he was a native of Kent County in the state of Delaware, and had been brought up as a house-servant by his master, who, on his death-bed, had made a will and directed him to be set free by his executors at the age of twenty-five, 
and that in the meantime he would be hired out as a servant to some person who should treat him well soon after the death of his master the executors hired him to a man in wilmington who employed him as a waiter in his house for three or four months and then took him to a small town called newport and sold him to a man who took him immediately to baltimore where he was again sold or transferred to another man who brought him to south carolina and sold him to a cotton planter with whom he had lived more than two years and had run away three weeks before the time i saw him with the intention of returning to delaware that being lame and becoming fatigued by travelling he had stopped here and made this shelter of boughs and bark of trees under which he had remained more than a week before i met him he invited me to go into his camp as he termed it where he had an old skillet more than a bushel of potatoes and several fowls all of which he said he had purloined from the plantations in the neighbourhood this encampment was in a level open wood and it appeared surprising to me that its occupant had not been discovered and conveyed back to his master before this time i told him that i thought he ran great risk of being taken up by remaining here and advised him to break up his lodge immediately and pursue his journey travelling only in the night-time he then proposed to join me and travel in company with me but this i declined because of his lameness and his great want of discretion though i did not assign these reasons to him i remained with this man two or three hours and ate dinner of fowls dressed after his rude fashion before leaving him i pressed upon him the necessity of immediately quitting the position he then occupied but he said he intended to remain there a few days longer unless i would take him with me on quitting my new acquaintance i thought it prudent to change my place of abode for the residue of this day and removed along the top of the hill that i occupied at least two miles and concealed myself in a thicket until night then returning to the road i had left in the morning and travelling hard all night i came to a large stream of water just at the break of day as it was too late to pass the river with safety this morning at the ford i went half a mile higher and swam across the stream in open daylight at a place where both sides of the water were skirted with woods i had several large potatoes that had been given to me by the man at his camp in the woods and these constituted my rations for the day at the rising and setting of the sun i took the bearing of the road by the course of the stream that i had crossed and found that I was travelling to the northwest instead of the north or northeast, to one of which latter points I wished to direct my march. Having perceived the country in which I now was to be thickly peopled, I remained in my resting place until late at night, when returning to the road and crossing it, I took once more to the woods, with the stars for my guides, and steered for the northeast. This was a fortunate night for me in all respects the atmosphere was clear the ground was high dry and free from thickets in the course of the night i passed several cornfields with the corn still remaining in them and passed a potato lot in which large quantities of fine potatoes were dug out of the ground and lay in heaps covered with vines but my most signal good luck occurred just before day when passing under a dogwood tree and hearing a noise in the branches above me i looked up and saw a large opossum amongst the berries that hung upon the boughs the game was quickly shaken down and turned out as fat as a well-fed pig and as heavy as a full-grown raccoon my attention was now turned to searching for a place in which i could secrete myself for the day and dress my provisions in quietness this day was clear and beautiful until the afternoon when the air became damp and the heavens were overhung with clouds the night that followed was dark as pitch compelling me to remain in my camp all night the next day brought with it a terrible storm of rain and wind that continued with but little intermission more than twenty-four hours and the sun was not again visible until the third day nor was there a clear night for more than a week during all this time i lay in my camp and subsisted upon the provisions that i had brought with me to this place the corn and potatoes looked so tempting when i saw them in the fields 
that I had taken more than I should have consumed, had not the bad weather compelled me to remain at this spot. But it was well for me for this time that I had taken more than I could eat in one or two days. At the end of the cloudy weather I felt much refreshed and strengthened, and resumed my journey in high spirits, although I now began to feel the want of shoes, those which I wore when I left my mistress having long since been worn out, and my boots were wrapped strips of hickory bark about my feet to keep the leather from separating and falling to pieces. It was now by my computation the month of November, and I was yet in the state of South Carolina. I began to consider with myself whether I had gained or lost by attempting to travel on the roads, and after revolving in my mind all of the disasters that had befallen me, determined to abandon the roads altogether, for two reasons, the first of which was that on the highways I was constantly liable to meet persons or to be overtaken by them, and a second, no less powerful, was that as I did not know what roads to pursue, I was oftener travelling on the wrong route than on the right one. Setting my face once more for the North Star, I advanced with a steady though slow pace for four or five nights, when I was again delayed by dark weather, and forced to remain in idleness nearly two weeks, and when the weather again became clear, I was arrested on the second night by a broad and rapid river, that appeared so formidable that I did not dare to attempt its passage until after examining it in daylight. On the succeeding night, however, I crossed it by swimming, resting at some large rocks near the middle. After gaining the north side of this river, which I believed to be the Catawba, I considered myself in North Carolina, and again steered towards the north. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18, Part 1 of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 18, Part 1 The month of November is, in all years, a season of clouds and vapours, but at the time of which I write the good weather vanished early in the month, and all the clouds of the universe seem to have collected in North Carolina. From the second night after crossing the Catawba I did not see the North Star for the space of three weeks and during all this time no progress was made in my journey. Although I seldom remained two days in the same place, but moved from one position to another for the purpose of eluding the observation of the people of the country, whose attention might have been attracted by the continual appearance of the smoke of my fires in one place. There had as yet been no hard frost, and the leaves were still on the oak trees, at the close of this cloudy weather, but the northwest wind which dispelled the mist also brought down nearly all the leaves of the forest, except those of the evergreen trees, and the nights now became clear, and the air keen with frost. Hitherto the oak woods had afforded me the safest shelter, but now I was obliged to seek for groves of young pines to retire to at dawn. Heretofore I had found a plentiful subsistence in every cornfield and potato lot that fell in my way, but now began to find some of the fields in which corn had grown, destitute of the corn, and containing nothing but the stalks. The potatoes had all been taken out of the lots where they grew, except in some few instances where they had been buried in the field, and the means of subsistence became every day more difficult to be obtained but as I had fine weather I made the best use of those hours in which I dared to travel, and was constantly moving, from a short time after dark until daylight. The toil that I underwent for the first half of the month of December was excessive, and my sufferings for want of food were great. I was obliged to carry with me a stock of corn sufficient to supply me for two or three days, 
for it frequently happened that I met with none in the fields for a long time. In the course of this period I crossed innumerable streams, the greater portion of which were small size, but some were of considerable magnitude, and in all of them the water had become almost as cold as ice. Sometimes I was fortunate enough to find boats or canoes tied at the side of the streams, and when this happened I always made free use of that which no one else was using at the time. But this did not occur often, and I believe that in those two weeks I swam over nine rivers or streams, so deep that I could not ford them. The number of creeks and rivulets through which I waded was far greater, but I cannot now fix the number. In one of these fine nights, passing near the house of a planter, I saw several dry hides hanging on poles under a shed. One of these hides I appropriated to myself, for the purpose of converting it into moccasins, to supply the place of my boots, which were totally worthless. By beating the dry hide with a stick, it was made sufficiently pliable to bear making it into moccasins, of which I made for myself three pair, wearing one and carrying the others on my back. One day, as I lay in a pine thicket, several pigs, which appeared to be wild, having no marks on their ears, came near me, and one of them approached so close without seeing me that I knocked it down with a stone and succeeded in killing it. This pig was very fat and would have weighed thirty if not forty pounds. Feeling now greatly exhausted with the fatigues that I had lately undergone, and being in a very great forest far removed from white inhabitants, I resolved to remain a few days in this place, to regale myself with the flesh of the pig, which I preserved by hanging it up in the shade after cutting it into pieces. Fortune, so adverse to me heretofore, seemed to have been more kind to me at this time, for the very night succeeding the day on which I killed the pig, a storm of hail, snow, and sleet came on, and continued fifteen or sixteen hours. The snow lay on the ground, four inches in depth, and the whole country was covered with a crust almost hard enough to bear a man. In this state of weather I could not travel, and my stock of pork was invaluable to me. The pork was frozen where it hung on the branches of the trees, and was as well preserved as if it had been buried in snow. But on the fourth day after the snow fell, the atmosphere underwent a great change. The wind blew from the south, the snow melted away, the air became warm, and the sun shone with the brightness and almost with the warmth of spring. It was manifest that my pork, which was now soft and oily, would not long be in a sound state. If I remained here, my provisions would become putrid on my hands in a short time, and compel me to quit my residence to avoid the atmosphere of the place. I resolved to pursue my journey, and prepared myself by roasting before the fire all my pork that was left, wrapping it up carefully in green pine leaves, and enveloping the whole in a sort of close basket that I made of small boughs of trees. Equipping myself for the journey, with my meat in my knapsack, I again took to the woods, with the stars for my guide, keeping the north star over my left eye. The weather had now become exceedingly variable, and I was seldom able to travel more than half the night. The fields were muddy, the low grounds in the woods were wet and often covered with water, through which I was obliged to wade. The air was damp and cold by day, the nights were frosty, very often covering the water with ice an inch in thickness. From the great degree of cold that prevailed, I inferred either that I was pretty far north, or that I had advanced too much to the left and was approaching the mountain country. To satisfy myself as far as possible of my situation, one fair day, when the sky was very clear, I climbed to the top of a pine tree that stood on the summit of a hill, and took a wide survey of the region around me. Eastward I saw nothing but a vast continuation of plantations intervened by forests. On the south the faint beams of a winter sun shed a soft luster over the woods, 
which were dotted at remote distances with the habitations of men and the openings that they had made in the green champagne of the endless pine groves that nature had planted in the direction of the midday sun on the north at a great distance i saw a tract of low and flat country which in my opinion was the vale of some great river and beyond this at the farthest stretch of vision the eye was lost in the blue transparent vault where the extremity of the arch of the world touches the abode of perpetual winter turning westward the view passed beyond the region of pine trees which was followed afar off by naked and leafless oaks hickories and walnuts and still beyond these rose high in the air elevated tracts of country clad in the white livery of snow and bearing the impress of midwinter it was now apparent that i had borne too far westward and was within a few days travel of the mountains descending from my observations i determined on the return of night to shape my course for the future nearly due east until i should at least be out of the mountains according to my calendar it was the day before christmas that i ascended the pine tree and i believe i was at that time in the northwestern part of north carolina not far from the banks of the yadkin river on the following night i travelled from dark until as i supposed around three or four o'clock in the morning when i came to a road which led as i thought in an easterly direction this road i travelled until daylight and encamped near it in an old field overgrown with young pines and holly trees this was christmas day and i celebrated it by breakfasting on fat pork without salt and substituted parched corn for bread in the evening the weather became cloudy and cold and when night came it was so dark that i found difficulty in keeping the road at some points where it made short angles before midnight it began to snow and at break of day the snow lay more than a foot deep this compelled me to seek winter quarters and fortunately at about half a mile from the road i found on the side of a steep hill a shelving rock that formed a dry covert with a southern prospect under this rock i took refuge and kindling a fire of dry sticks considered myself happy to possess a few pounds of my roasted pork and more than half a gallon of corn that i carried in my pockets the snow continued falling until it was full two feet deep around me and the danger of exposing myself to discovery by my tracks in the snow compelled me to keep close to my hiding place until the third day when i ventured to go back to the road which i found broken by the passage of numerous wagons sleds and horses and so much beaten that i could travel it with ease at night the snow affording good light accordingly at night i again advanced on my way which indeed i was obliged to do for my corn was quite gone and not more than a pound of my pork remained to me i travelled hard through the night and after the morning star rose came to a river which i think must have been the yadkin it appeared to be about two hundred yards wide and the water ran with great rapidity in it waiting until the eastern horizon was tinged with the first rays of the morning light i entered the river at the ford and waded until the water was nearly three feet deep when it felt as if it was cutting the flesh from the bones of my limbs and a large cake of ice floating downward forced me off my balance and i was near falling my courage failed me and i returned to the shore but found the pain that already tormented me greatly increased when i was out of the water and exposed to the action of the open air returning to the river i plunged into the current to relieve me from the pinching frost that gnawed every part of my skin that had become wet and rushing forward as fast as the weight of the water that pressed me downward would permit was soon up to my chin in melted ice when rising to the surface i exerted my utmost strength and skill to gain the opposite shore by swimming in the shortest space of time at every stroke of my arms and legs they were cut and bruised by cakes of solid ice or weighed down by floating masses of congealed snow 
it is impossible for human life to be long sustained in such an element as that which encompassed me and i had not been afloat five minutes before i felt chilled in all my members and in less than double of that time my limbs felt numb and my hands became stiff and almost powerless when at the distance of thirty feet from the shore my body was struck by a violent current produced by a projecting rock above me and driven with resistless violence down the stream wholly unable to contend with the fury of the waves and penetrated by the coldness of death in my inmost vitals i gave myself up for lost and was commending my soul to god whom i expected to be my immediate judge when i perceived the long hanging branch of a large tree sweeping to and fro and undulating backward and forward as its extremities were washed by the surging current of the river just below me in a moment i was in contact with the tree and making the effort of despair seized one of its limbs bowed down by the weight of my body the branch yielded to the power of the water which rushing against my person swept me round like the quadrant of a circle and dashed me against the shore where clinging to some roots that grew near the bank the limb of the tree left me and springing with elastic force to its former position again dipped its slender branches in the mad stream crawling out of the water and being once more on dry land i found my circumstances little less desperate than when i was struggling with the floating ice the morning was frosty and icicles hung in long pendant groups from the trees along the shore of the river and the hoar-frost glistened in sparkling radiance upon the polished surface of the smooth snow as it whitened all the plain before me and spread its chill but beautiful covering through the woods there were three alternatives before me one of which i knew must be quickly adopted the one was to obtain a fire by which i could dry and warm my stiffened limbs the second was to die without the fire the third to go to the first house if i could reach one and surrender myself as a runaway slave staggering rather than walking forward until i gained the cover of a wood at a short distance from the river i turned into it and found that a field bordered the wood within less than twenty rods of the road within a few yards of the fence i stopped and taking out my fire apparatus to my unspeakable joy found them dry and in perfect safety with the aid of my punk and some dry moss gathered from the fence a small flame was obtained to which dry leaves being added from the boughs of a white oak tree that had fallen before the frost of the last autumn had commenced i soon had fire of sufficient intensity to consume dry wood with which i supplied it partly from the fence and partly from the branches of the fallen tree having raked away the snow from about the fire by the time the sun was up my frozen clothes were smoking before the coals warming first one side and then the other i felt the glow of returning life once more invigorating my blood and giving animation to my frozen limbs the public road was near me on one hand and an enclosed field before me on the other but in my present condition it was impossible for me to leave this place to-day without danger of perishing in the woods or of being arrested on the road as evening came on the air became much colder than it was in the forenoon and after night the wind rose high and blew from the northwest with intense keenness my limbs were yet stiff from the effects of my morning adventure and to complete my distress i was totally without provisions having left a few ears of corn that i had in my pocket on the other side of the river leaving my fire in the night and advancing into the field near me i discovered a house at some distance and as there was no light or sign of fire about it i determined to reconnoitre the premises which turned out to be a small barn standing alone with no other inhabitants about it than a few cattle and a flock of sheep after much trouble i succeeded in entering the barn by starting the nails that confined one of the boards at the corner entering the house i found it nearly filled with corn in the husks and some from which the husks had been removed was lying in a heap in one corner into these husks i crawled 
and covering myself deeply under them, soon became warm, and fell into a profound sleep, from which I was awakened by the noise of people walking about in the barn, and talking of the cattle and sheep, which it appeared they had come to feed, for they soon commenced working in the corn husks with which I was covered, and throwing them out to the cattle. I expected at every moment that they would uncover me, but fortunately before they saw me they ceased their operations, and went to work, some husking corn and throwing the husks on the pile over me, while others were employed in loading the husked corn into carts, as I learned by their conversation, and hauling it away to the house. The people continued working in the barn all day, and in the evening gave more husks to the cattle and went home. Waiting two or three hours after my visitors were gone, I rose from the pile of husks, and, filling my pockets with ears of corn, issued from the barn at the same place by which I had entered it, and returned to the woods, where I kindled a fire in a pine thicket, and parched more than half a gallon of corn. Before day I returned to the barn, and again secreted myself in the corn husks. In the morning the people again returned to their work, and husked corn until evening. At night I again repaired to the woods, and parched more corn. In this manner I passed more than a month, lying in the barn all day, and going to the woods at night. But at length the corn was all husked, and I watched daily the progress that was made in feeding the cattle with the husks, knowing that I must quit my winter retreat before the husks were exhausted. Before the husked corn was removed from the barn, I had conveyed several bushels of the ears into the husks near my bed, and concealed them from my winter's stock. Whilst I lay in this barn there were frequent and great changes of weather. The snow that covered the earth to the depth of two feet when I came here did not remain more than ten days, and was succeeded by more than a week of warm rainy weather, which was in turn succeeded by several days of dry weather, with cold high winds from the north. The month of February was cloudy and damp, with several squalls of snow and frequent rains. About the first of March the atmosphere became clear and dry, and the winds boisterous from the west. On the third of this month, having filled my little bag and all of my pockets with parched corn, I quitted my winter quarters, about ten o'clock at night, and again proceeded on my way to the north, leaving a large heap of corn husks still lying in the corner of the barn. On leaving this place I again pursued the road that had led me to it for several nights, crossing many small streams in my way, all of which I was able to pass without swimming, though several of them were so deep that they wet me as high as my armpits. This road led nearly northeast, and was the only road that I had fallen in with since I left Georgia that had maintained that direction for so great a distance. Nothing extraordinary befell me until the 12th of March, when, venturing to turn out earlier than usual in the evening, and proceeding along the road, I found that my way led me down a hill along the side of which the road had been cut into the earth ten or twelve feet in depth, having steep banks on each side, which were now so damp and slippery that it was impossible for a man to ascend either the one or the other. While in this narrow place I heard the sound of horses proceeding up the hill to meet me. Stopping to listen, in a moment almost two horsemen were close before me, trotting up the road. To escape on either hand was impossible, and to retreat backwards would have exposed me to certain destruction. Only one means of salvation was left, and I embraced it. Near the place where I stood was a deep gully cut in one side of the road, by which the water had run down here in time of rain. Into this gully I threw myself, and lying down close to the ground, the horsemen rode almost over me and passed on. When they were gone I arose, and descending the hill found a river before me. In crossing this stream I was compelled to swim at least two hundred yards, and found the cold so oppressive after coming out of the water that I was forced to stop at the first thick woods that I could find and make a fire to dry myself. I did not move again until the next night, 
and on the fourth night after this came to a great river, which I suppose was the Roanoke. I was obliged to swim this stream, and was carried a great way down by the rapidity of the current. It must have been more than an hour from the time I entered the water until I reached the opposite shore, and as the rivers were yet very cold, I suffered greatly at this place. End of chapter 18, part 1「Chapter eighteen, part two of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 18, Part 2 Judging by the aspect of the country, I believed myself to be at this time in Virginia, and was now reduced to the utmost extremity for want of provisions. The corn that I had parched at the barn and brought with me was nearly exhausted, and no more was to be obtained in the fields at this season of the year. For three or four days I allowed myself only my two hands full of parched corn per day and after this I travelled three days without tasting food of any kind. But being nearly exhausted with hunger, I one night entered an old stack-yard, hoping that I might fall in with pigs or poultry of some kind. I found, instead of these, a stack of oats which had not been threshed. From this stack I took as much oats in the sheaf as I could carry, and going on a few miles, stopped in a pine forest, made a large fire, and parched at least a half a gallon of the oats, after rubbing the grain from the straw. After the grain was parched, I again rubbed it in my hands, to separate it from the husks, and spent the night in feasting on parched oats. The weather was now becoming quite warm, though the water was cold in the rivers, and I perceived the farmers had everywhere ploughed their fields, preparatory to planting corn. Every night I saw people burning brush in the new grounds that they were clearing of the wood and brush, and when the day came, on the morning after I obtained the oats, I perceived people planting corn in a field about half a mile from my fire. According to my computation of the time, it was on the night of the last day of March that I obtained the oats, and the appearance of the country satisfied me that I had not lost many days in my reckoning. I lay in this pine wood two days, for the purpose of recruiting my strength after my long fast, and when I again resumed my journey, determined to seek some large road leading towards the north, and follow it in future, the one that I had been pursuing of late not appearing to be a principal highway of the country. For this purpose, striking off across the fields in an easterly direction, I travelled a few hours, and was fortunate enough to come to a great road which was manifestly much travelled, leading towards the northeast. My bag was now replenished with more than a gallon of parched oats, and I had yet one pair of moccasins made of the rawhide. But my shirt was totally gone, and my last pair of trousers was now in actual service. A tolerable waistcoat still remained to me and my greatcoat, though full of honourable scars, was yet capable of much service. Having resolved to pursue the road I was now in, it was necessary again to resort to the utmost degree of caution to prevent surprise. Travelling only after it was dark, and taking care to stop before the appearance of day, my progress was not rapid, but my safety was preserved. The acquisition of food had now become difficult, and when my oats began to fail, I resorted to the dangerous expedient of attacking the corn-crib of a planter that was near the road. The house was built of round logs and covered with boards. One of these boards I succeeded in removing on the side of the crib opposite from the dwelling, and by thrusting my arm downwards was able to reach the corn, of which I took as much as filled my bag, the pockets of my great coat, and a large handkerchief that I had preserved through all the vicissitudes of my journey. 
this opportune supply of corn furnished me with food more than a week, and before it was consumed I reached the Appomattox River, which I crossed in a canoe that I found tied at the shore, a few miles above the town of Petersburg. Having approached Petersburg in the night, I was afraid to attempt to pass through it, lest the patrol should fall in with me, and turning to the left, through the country, reached the river and crossed in safety. The great road leading to Richmond is so distinguishingly marked above the other ways in this part of Virginia that there was no difficulty in following it, and on the third night after passing Petersburg I obtained a sight of the capital of Virginia. It was only a little after midnight when the city presented itself to my sight, but here, as well as at Petersburg, I was afraid to attempt to go through the town, under cover of the darkness, because of the patrol. Turning, therefore, back into a forest, about two miles from the small town on the south side of the river, I lay there until after twelve o'clock in the day, when, loosening the package from my back, and taking it in my hand in the form of a bundle, I advanced into the village as if I had only come from some plantation in the neighborhood. This was on Sunday, I believe, although according to my computation it was Monday, but it must have been Sunday, for the village was quiet, and in passing it I only saw two or three persons, whom I passed as if I had not seen them. No one spoke to me, and I gained the bridge in safety and crossed it without attracting the least attention. Entering the city of Richmond, I kept along the principal street, walking at a slow pace and turning my head from side to side, as if much attracted by the objects around me. Few persons were in the street, and I was careful to appear more attentive to the houses than to the people. At the upper end of the city I saw a great crowd of ladies and gentlemen who were, I believe, returning from church. While these people were passing me, I stood in the street, on the outside of the foot pavement, with my face turned to the opposite side of the street. They all went by without taking any notice of me, and when they were gone I again resumed my leisure walk along the pavement, and reached the utmost limit of the town without being accosted by any one. As soon as I was clear of the city I quickened my pace, assumed the air of a man in great haste, sometimes actually ran, and in less than an hour was safely lodged in the thickest part of the woods that lay on the north of Richmond, and full four miles from the river. This was the boldest exploit that I had performed since leaving my mistress, except the visit I paid to that gentleman in Georgia. My corn was now failing, but as I had once entered a crib secretly, I felt but little apprehension on account of future supplies. After this time I never wanted corn, and did not again suffer by hunger, until I reached the place of my nativity. After leaving Richmond I again kept along the great road by which I had travelled on my way south, taking great care not to expose my person unnecessarily. For several nights I saw no white people on the way, but was often met by black ones, whom I avoided by turning out of the road. But one moonlight night, five or six days after I left Richmond, a man stepped out of the woods almost at my side, and, accosting me in a familiar manner, asked me which way I was travelling, how long I had been on the road, and made many inquiries concerning the course of my late journey. This man was a mulatto, and carried a heavy cane, or rather club, in his hand. I did not like his appearance, and the idea of a familiar conversation with any one seemed to terrify me. I determined to watch on my companion closely, and he appeared equally intent on observing me. But at the same time that he talked with me, he was constantly drawing closer to and following behind me. This conduct increased my suspicion, and I began to wish to get rid of him, but could not at the moment imagine how I should effect my purpose. To avoid him I crossed the road several times, but still he followed me closely. The moon, which shone brightly upon our backs, cast his shadow far before me, 
and enabled me to perceive his motions with the utmost accuracy without turning my head towards him he carried his club under his left arm and at length raised his right hand gently took the stick by the end and drawing it slowly over his head was in the very act of striking a blow at me when springing backward and raising my own staff at the same moment i brought him to the ground by a stroke on his forehead and when i had him down beat him over the back and sides with my weapon until he roared for mercy and begged me not to kill him i left him in no condition to pursue me and hastened on my way resolved to get as far from him before day as my legs would carry me this man was undoubtedly one of those wretches who are employed by white men to kidnap and betray such unfortunate people of color as may chance to fall into their hands but for once the deceiver was deceived and he who intended to make a prey of me had well nigh fallen a sacrifice himself the same night i crossed the pamunkey river near the village of hanover by swimming and secreted myself before day in a dense cedar thicket the next night after i had travelled several miles in ascending a hill i saw the head of a man rise on the opposite side without having heard any noise i instantly ran into the woods and concealed myself behind a large tree the traveller was on horseback and the road being sandy and his horse moving only at a walk i had not heard his approach until i saw him he also saw me for when he came opposite the place where i stood he stopped his horse in the road and desired me to tell him how far it was to some place the name of which i have forgotten as i made no answer he again repeated the inquiry and then said i need not be afraid to speak as he did not wish to hurt me but no answer being given him he at last said i might as well speak and then rode on before day i reached the mattapony river and crossed it by wading but knowing that i was not far from maryland i fell into a great indiscretion and forgot the wariness and caution that had enabled me to overcome obstacles apparently insurmountable anxious to get forward i neglected to conceal myself before day but travelled until daybreak before i sought a place of concealment and unfortunately when i looked for a hiding place none was at hand this compelled me to keep on the road until grey twilight for the purpose of reaching a wood that was in view before me but to gain this wood i was obliged to pass a house that stood at the roadside and when only about fifty yards beyond the house a white man opened the door and seeing me in the road called to me to stop as this order was not obeyed he set his dog upon me the dog was quickly vanquished by my stick and setting off to run at full speed i at the same moment heard the report of a gun and received its contents in my legs chiefly about and in my hams I fell on the road, and was soon surrounded by several persons, who it appeared were a party of patrollers, who had gathered together in this house. They ordered me to cross my hands, which order not being immediately obeyed, they beat me with sticks and stones, until I was almost senseless, and entirely unable to make resistance. Then they bound me with cords, and dragged me by the feet back to the house, and threw me into the kitchen like a dead dog one of my eyes was almost beaten out and the blood was running from my mouth nose and ears but in this condition they refused to wash the blood from my face or even to give me a drink of water in a short time a justice of the peace arrived and when he looked at me he ordered me to be unbound and to have some water to wash myself and also some bread to eat this man's heart appeared not to be altogether void of sensibility for he reprimanded in harsh terms those who had beaten me told them that their conduct was brutal and that it would have been more humane to kill me outright than to bruise and mangle me in the manner they had done he then interrogated me as to my name place of abode and place of destination 
and afterwards demanded the name of my master. To all these inquiries I made no reply, except that I was going to Maryland where I lived. The justice told me it was his duty under the law to send me to jail, and I was immediately put into a cart and carried to a small village called Bowling Green, which I reached before ten o'clock. There I was locked up in the jail, and a doctor came to examine my legs and extract the shot from my wounds. In the course of the operation he took out thirty-four buckshot, and after dressing my legs left me to my own reflections. No fever followed in the train of my disasters, which I attributed to the reduced state of my blood by long fasting and the fatigues I had undergone. In the afternoon the jailer came to see me, and brought my daily allowance of provisions and a jug of water. The provisions consisted of more than a pound of cornbread and some boiled bacon. As my appetite was good, I immediately devoured more than two-thirds of this food, but reserved the rest for supper. For several days I was not able to stand, and in this period found great difficulty in performing the ordinary offices of life for myself, no one coming to give me any aid. But I did not suffer for want of food, the daily allowance of the jailer being quite sufficient to appease the cravings of hunger. After I grew better and was able to walk in the jail, the jailer frequently called to see me and endeavored to prevail on me to tell where I came from but in this undertaking he was no more successful than the justice had been in the same business. I remained in the jail more than a month, and in this time became quite fat and strong, but saw no way by which I could escape. The jail was of brick, the floors were of solid oak boards, and the door of the same material was secured by iron bolts let into its posts, and connected together by a strong band of iron reaching from one to the other. Everything appeared sound and strong, and to add to my security, my feet were chained together from the time my wounds were healed. This chain I acquired the knowledge of removing from my feet, by working out of its socket a small iron pin that secured the bolt that held the chain round one of my legs. The jailer came to see me with great regularity every morning and evening, but remained only a few minutes when he came, leaving me entirely alone at all other times. When I had been in prison thirty-nine days, and had quite recovered from the wounds that I had received, the jailer was late in coming to me with my breakfast, and going to the door I began to beat against it with my fist for the purpose of making a noise. After beating some time against the door, I happened, by mere accident, to strike my fist against one of the posts, which, to my surprise, I discovered, by its sound, to be a mere hollow shell, encrusted with a thin coat of sound timber, and as I struck it, the rotten wood crumbled to pieces within. On a more careful examination of this post, I became satisfied that I could easily split it to pieces by the aid of the iron bolt that confined my feet. The jailer came with my breakfast and reprimanded me for making a noise. This day appeared as long to me as a week had done heretofore. But night came at last, and as soon as the room in which I was confined had become quite dark, I disentangled myself from the irons with which I was bound and with the aid of the long bolt easily wrenched from its place the large staple that held one end of the bar that lay across the door. The hasps that held the lock in its place were drawn away almost without force, and the door swung open of its own weight. I now walked out into the jail-yard, and found that all was quiet, and that only a few lights were burning in the village windows. At first I walked slowly along the road, but soon quickened my pace and ran along the highway, until I was more than a mile from the jail. Then, taking to the woods, I travelled all night in a northern direction. At the approach of day I concealed myself in a cedar thicket, where I lay until the next evening without anything to eat. 
On the second night after my escape, I crossed the Potomac at Hoe's Ferry in a small boat that I found tied at the side of the ferry flat, and on the night following crossed the Patuxent in a canoe which I found chained at the shore. About one o'clock in the morning I came to the door of my wife's cabin, and stood there, I believe, more than five minutes, before I could summon sufficient fortitude to knock. I at length rapped lightly on the door, and was immediately asked in the well-known voice of my wife, "'Who is there?' I replied, "'Charles.' She then came to the door, and opening it slowly, said, "'Who is this that speaks so much like my husband?' I then rushed into the cabin and made myself known to her, but it was some time before I could convince her that I was really her husband returned from Georgia. The children were then called up, but they had forgotten me. When I attempted to take them in my arms, they fled from me and took refuge under the bed of their mother. My eldest boy, who was four years old when I was carried away, still retained some recollections of once having had a father, but could not believe that I was that father. My wife, who at first was overcome by astonishment, and was incapable of giving credit to the fidelity of her own vision, after I had been in the house a few minutes, seemed to awake from a dream, and gathering all three of her children in her arms, thrust them into my lap as I sat in the corner, clapped her hands, laughed, and cried by turns, and in her ecstasy forgot to give me any supper, until at length I told her that I was hungry. Before I entered the house I felt as if I could eat anything in the shape of food, but now that I attempted to eat my appetite had fled, and I sat up all night with my wife and children. When on my journey I thought of nothing but getting home, and never reflected that when at home I might still be in danger. But now that my toils were ended, I began to consider with myself how I could appear in safety in Calvert County, where everybody must know that I was a runaway slave. With my heart thrilling with joy when I looked upon my wife and children, who had not hoped ever to behold me again, yet fearful of the coming of daylight, which must expose me to be arrested as a fugitive slave. I passed the night between the happiness of the present and the dread of the future. In all the toils, dangers, and sufferings of my long journey, my courage had never forsaken me. The hope of again seeing my wife and little ones had borne me triumphantly, through perils that even now I reflect upon as upon some extravagant dream but when I found myself at rest under the roof of my wife, the object of my labors attained, and no motive to arouse my energies or give them the least impulse, that firmness of resolution which had so long sustained me suddenly vanished from my bosom, and I passed the night with my children around me, oppressed by a melancholy foreboding of my future destiny. The idea that I was utterly unable to afford protection and safeguard to my own family, and was myself even more helpless than they, tormented my bosom with alternate throbs of affection and fear, until the dawn broke in the east and summoned me to decide upon my future conduct. In the morning I went to the great house and showed myself to my master and mistress. They gave me a good breakfast, and advised me at first to conceal myself, but afterwards to work in the neighborhood for wages. For eight years I lived in this region of country, and experienced a variety of fortune. At last I had saved near four hundred dollars, and bought near Baltimore twelve acres of land, a yoke of oxen, and two cows, and attended the Baltimore market. I had the great misfortune to lose my wife. I married in two years, and of my second wife had four children. Ten years of happiness and comparative ease I enjoyed on my little farm, and I had settled down into contentment, little fearing any more trouble. 
but a sad fate was before me. End of Chapter 18, Part 2《Chapter 19 of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lathatia. Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 19. In the month of June, 18... I forget the exact year. As I was plowing in my lot, three gentlemen rode up to my fence, and alighting from their horses, all came over the fence and approached me, when one of them told me he was the sheriff, and had a writ in his pocket, which commanded him to take me to Baltimore. I was not conscious of having done anything injurious to anyone, but yet felt the distrust of these men, who were all strangers to me. I told them I would go with them, if they would permit me to turn my oxen loose from the plow. But it was my intention to seek an opportunity of escaping to the house of a gentleman who lived about a mile from me. This purpose I was not able to effect, for whilst I was taking the yoke from the oxen, one of the gentlemen came behind me and knocked me down with a heavy whip that he carried in his hand. When I recovered from the stunning effects of this blow, I found myself bound with my hands behind me, and strong cords closely wrapped about my arms. In this condition I was forced to set out immediately, for Baltimore, without speaking to my wife or even entering my door. I expected that, on arriving at Baltimore, I should be taken before a judge for the purpose of being tried, but in this I was deceived. They led me to the city jail and there shut me up with several other black people, both men and women who told me that they had lately been purchased by a trader from Georgia. I now saw the extent of my misfortune, but could not learn who the persons were who had seized me. In the evening, however, one of the gentlemen who had brought me from my home came into the jail with the jailer and asked me if I knew him. On being answered in the negative, he told me that he knew me very well and asked me if I did not recollect the time when he and his brother had whipped me before my master's door in Georgia. I now recognized the features of the younger of the two brothers of my mistress, but this man was so changed in his appearance from the time when I had last seen him that if he had not declared himself, I should never have known him. When I left Georgia, he was not more than twenty-one or two years of age and had black, bushy hair. His hair was now thin and gray, and all his features were changed. After lying in jail a little more than two weeks, strongly ironed, my fellow prisoners and I were one day chained together, handcuffed in pairs, and in this way driven about ten miles out of Baltimore, where we remained all night. On the evening of the second day we halted at Bladensburg. On the next morning we marched through Washington, and as we passed in front of the President's house I saw an old gentleman walking in the grounds near the gate. This man, I was told, was the President of the United States. Within four weeks after we left Washington, I was in Milledgeville in Georgia, near which the man who had kidnapped me resided. He took me home with him and set me to work on his plantation. But I had now enjoyed liberty too long to submit quietly to the endurance of slavery. I had no sooner come here than I began to devise ways of escaping again from the hands of my tyrants and of making my way to the northern states. The month of August was now approaching, which is a favorable season of the year to travel, on account of the abundance of food that is to be found in the cornfields and orchards. But I remembered the dreadful sufferings that I had endured in my former journey from the south, and determined, if possible, to devise some scheme of getting away that would not subject me to such hardships. After several weeks of consideration, I resolved to run away, go to some of the seaports, and endeavor to get a passage on board a vessel bound to a northern city. With this view, I assumed the appearance of resignation and composure under the new aspect of my fortune, and even went so far as to tell my new master that I lived more comfortably with him in his cotton fields than I had formerly done on my own small farm in Maryland. 
though I believe my master did me the justice to give no credit to my assertions on this subject. From the moment I discovered in Maryland that I had fallen into the hands of the brother of my former mistress, I gave up all hope of contesting his right to arrest me, with success, at law, as I suppose he had come with authority to reclaim me as a property of his sister. But after I had returned to Georgia, and had been at work some weeks on the plantation of my new master, I learned that he now claimed me as his own slave, and that he had reported he had purchased me in Baltimore. It was now clear to me that this man, having by some means learned the place of my residence in Maryland, had kidnapped and now held me as his slave, without the color of legal right. But complaint on my part was useless, and resistance vain. I was again reduced to the condition of a common field slave on a cotton plantation in Georgia, and compelled to subsist on the very scanty and coarse food allowed to the southern slave. I had been absent from Georgia almost twenty years, and in that period great changes had doubtlessly taken place in the face of the country, as well as in the condition of human society. I had never been in Milledgeville until I was brought there by the man who had kidnapped me in Maryland, and I was now a slave among entire strangers, and had no friends to give me the consolation of kind words, such as I had formerly received from my master in Morgan County. The plantation on which I was now a slave had formerly belonged to the father of my mistress, and some of my fellow slaves had been well acquainted with her in her youth. From these people I learned that after the death of my master and my flight from Georgia, my mistress had become the wife of a second husband who had removed with her to the state of Louisiana more than fifteen years ago. After ascertaining these facts, which proved beyond all doubt that my present master had no right whatsoever to me, in either law or justice, I determined that before encountering the dangers and suffering that must necessarily attend my second flight from Georgia, I would attempt to proclaim the protection of the laws of the country and tried to get myself discharged from the unjust slavery in which I was now held. For this purpose, I went to Milledgeville one Sunday and inquired for a lawyer of a black man whom I met in the street. This person told me that his master was a lawyer and went with me to his house. The lawyer, after talking to me some time, told me that my master was his client and that he therefore could not undertake my cause but referred me to a young gentleman, who he said would do my business for me. Accordingly to this young man I went, and after relating my whole story to him, he told me that he believed he could not do anything for me, as I had no witness to prove my freedom. I rejoined that it seemed hard that I must be compelled to prove myself a free man, and that it would appear more consonant to reason that my master should prove me to be a slave. He, however, assured me that this was not the law of Georgia, where every man of color was presumed to be a slave until he could prove that he was free. He then told me that if I expected him to talk to me, I must give him a fee, whereupon I gave him all the money I had been able to procure since my arrival in the country, which was two dollars and seventy-five cents. When I offered him this money, the lawyer tossed his head and said such a trifle was not worth accepting. But nevertheless he took it, and then asked me if I could get some more money before the next Sunday. That if I could get another dollar, he would issue a writ and have me brought before the court. But if he succeeded in getting me set free, I must engage to serve him a year. To these conditions I agreed, and signed a paper which the lawyer wrote, and which was signed by two persons as witnesses. The brother of my pretended master was yet living in this neighborhood, and the lawyer advised me to have him brought forward, as a witness, to prove that I was not the slave of my present pretended owner. On the Wednesday, following my visit to Milledgeville, the sheriff came to my master's plantation and took me from the field to the house, telling me as I walked beside him that he had a writ which commanded him to take me to Milledgeville. Instead, however, of obeying the command of his writ, when we arrived at the house, he took a bond of my master that he would produce me at the courthouse on the next day, Friday, and then rode away, leaving me at the mercy of my kidnapper. Since I had been on this plantation, I had never been whipped, 
although all the other slaves, of whom there were more than fifty, were frequently flogged without any apparent cause. I had all along attributed my exemption from the lash to the fears of my master. He knew I had formerly run away from his sister on account of her cruelty and his own savage conduct to me, and I believed that he was still apprehensive that a repetition of his former barbarity might produce the same effect that it had done twenty years before. His evil passions were like fire covered with ashes, concealed, not extinguished. He now found that I was determined to try to regain my liberty at all events, and the sheriff was no sooner gone than the overseer was sent for, come from the field, and I was tied up and whipped, with the long lashed negro whip, until I fainted, and was carried in a state of insensibility to my lodgings in the quarter. It was night when I recovered my understanding sufficiently to be aware of my true situation. I now found that my wounds had been oiled, and that I was wrapped in a piece of clean linen cloth. But for several days I was unable to leave my bed. When Friday came, I was not taken to Milledgeville, and afterwards learned that my master reported to the court that I had been taken ill, and was not able to leave the house. The judge asked no questions as to the cause of my illness. At the end of two weeks I was taken to Milledgeville and carried before a judge, who first asked a few questions of my master, as to the length of time that he had owned me and the place where he had purchased me. He stated in my presence that he had purchased me with several others at public auction in the city of Baltimore and had paid five hundred and ten dollars for me. I was not permitted to speak to the court, much less to contradict this falsehood in the manner it deserved. The brother of my master was then called as a witness by my lawyer, but the witness refused to be sworn or examined on account of his interest in me as a slave. In support of his refusal, he produced a bill of sale from my master to himself for an equal, undivided half pad of the slave. This bill of sale was dated several weeks previous to the time of trial and gave rise to an argument between the opposing lawyers that continued until the court adjourned in the evening. On the next morning I was again brought into court, and the judge now delivered his opinion, which was that the witness could not be compelled to give evidence in a cause to which he was really, though not nominally, a party. The court then proceeded to give judgment in the cause now before it, and declared that the law was well settled in Georgia, that every negro was presumed to be a slave, until he proved his freedom by the clearest evidence. That where a negro was found in the custody of keeping of a white man, the law declared that white man to be his master, without any evidence on the subject. But the case before the court was exceedingly plain, and free from all doubt or difficulty. Here the master had brought this slave into the state of Georgia, as his property, has held him as a slave ever since, and still holds him as a slave. The title of the master in this case is the best title that a man can have to any property, and the order of the court is that the slave be returned to the custody of his master. I was immediately ordered to return home, and from this time until I left the plantation my life was a continual torment to me. The overseer often came up to me in the field and gave me several lashes with his long whip over my naked back through mere wantonness and I was often compelled, after I had done my day's work in the field, to cut wood or perform some other labor at the house, until long after dark. My sufferings were too great to be borne long by any human creature, and to a man who had once tasted the sweets of liberty, they were doubly tormenting. There was nothing in the form of danger that could intimidate me, if the road on which I had to encounter it led me to freedom. That season of the year most favorable to my escape from bondage had at length arrived. The corn in the fields was so far grown as to be fit for roasting. The peaches were beginning to ripen, and the sweet potatoes were large enough to be eaten. But notwithstanding all this, the difficulties that surrounded me were greater than can easily be imagined by anyone who has never been a slave in the lower country of Georgia. In the first place, I was almost naked having no other clothes than a ragged shirt of tow cloth, 
and a pair of old trousers of the same material, with an old woolen jacket that I had brought with me from home. In addition to this, I was closely watched every evening until I had finished the labor assigned me, and then I was locked up in a small cabin by myself for the night. This cabin was really a prison, and had been built for the purpose of confining such of the slaves of this estate as were tried in the evening, and sentenced to be whipped in the morning. It was built of strong oak logs, hewn square, and dovetailed together at the corners. It had no window in it, but as the logs did not fit very close together, there was never any want of air in this jail, in which I had been locked up every night since my trial before the court. On Sundays I was permitted to go to work in the fields, with the other people who worked on that day, if I chose to do so. But at this time I was put under the charge of an old African Negro, who was instructed to give immediate information if I attempted to leave the field. To escape on Sunday was impossible, and there seemed to be no hope of getting out of my sleeping room the floor of which was made of strong pine plank. Fortune at length did for me that which I had not been able to accomplish by the greatest of efforts for myself. The lock that was on the door of my nightly prison was a large stock lock, and had been clumsily fitted on the door, so that the end of the lock pressed against the door case and made it difficult to shut the door, even in dry weather. When the weather was damp and the wood was swollen with moisture, it was not easy to close the door at all. Late in the month of September, the weather became cloudy, and much rain fell. The clouds continued to obscure the heavens for four or five days. One evening, when I was ordered to my house, as it was called, the overseer followed me without a light, although it was very dark. When I was in the house, he pushed the door after me with all his strength. The violence of the effort caused the door to pass within the case at the top, for one or two feet, and this held it so fast that he could not again pull it open. Supposing, in the extreme darkness, that the door was shut, he turned the key, and the bolt of the lock passing on the outside of the staple intended to receive it completely deceived him. He then withdrew the key and went away. Soon after he was gone, I went to the door, and feeling with my hands, ascertained that it was not shut. An opportunity now presented itself for me to escape from my prison house, with a prospect of being able to be so far from my master's residence before morning that none could soon overtake me, even should the course of my flight be ascertained. Waiting quietly, until everyone about the quarter had ceased to be heard, I applied one of my feet to the door, and giving it a strong push, forced it open. The world was now all before me, but the darkness was so profound as to obscure from my vision the largest objects, even a house, at the distance of a few yards. But dark as it was, necessity compelled me to leave the plantation without delay, and knowing only the great road that led to Milledgeville, amongst the various roads of this country, I set off at a brisk walk on this public highway, assured that no one could apprehend me in so dark a night. It was only about seven miles to Milledgeville, and when I reached that town several lights were burning in the windows of the houses, but keeping on directly through the village, I neither saw nor heard any person in it, and after gaining the open country, my first care was to find some secure place where shelter could be found for the next day, but no appearance of thick woods was to be seen for several miles and two or three hours must have elapsed before a forest of sufficient magnitude was found to answer my purposes. It was perhaps three o'clock in the morning when I took refuge in a thick and dismal swamp that lay on the right hand of the road, intending to remain here until daylight and then look out for a secret place to conceal myself in during the day. Hitherto, although the night was extremely dark, it had not rained any, but soon after my halt in the swamp, the rain began to fall in floods rather than showers, which made me as wet as if I had swam a river. Daylight at length appeared, but brought with it very little mitigation of my sufferings, for the swamp in which my hiding place was lay in the midst of a well-peopled country and was surrounded on all sides by cotton and cornfields, so close to me that the open spaces of the cleared land could be seen from my position. It was dangerous to move, lest someone should see me, 
and painful to remain without food when hunger was consuming me. My resting place in the swamp was within view of the road, and soon after sunrise, although it continued to rain fast, numerous horsemen were seen passing along the road by the way that had led me to the swamp. There was little doubt in my mind that these people were in search of me, and the sequel proved that my surmises were well founded. It rained throughout this day, and the fear of being apprehended by those who came in pursuit of me confined me to the swamp until after dark the following evening, when I ventured to leave the thicket and return to the high road, the bearing of which it was impossible for me to ascertain on account of the dense clouds that obscured the heavens. All that could be done in my situation was to take care to not follow that end of the road which had led me to the swamp. Turning my back once more upon Milledgeville and walking at a quick pace, Every effort was made to remove myself as far as possible this night from the scene of suffering, for which that swamp will always be memorable in my mind. The rain had ceased to fall at the going down of the sun, and the darkness of this second night was not so great as that of the first had been. This circumstance was regarded by me as a happy presage of the final success that awaited my undertaking. Events proved that I was no prophet, for the dim light of this night was the cause of the sad misfortune that awaited me. In a former part of this volume, the reader is made acquainted with the deep interest that is taken by all the planters, far and wide, around the plantation from which a slave has escaped by running away. Twenty years had wrought no change in favor of the fugitive, nor had the feuds and dissensions that agitate and distract the communities of white men produced any relaxation in the friendship that they profess to feel and really do feel for each other on a question of so much importance to them all. More than twenty miles of road had been left behind me this night, and it must have been two or three o'clock in the morning when, as I was passing a part of the road that led through a dense pine grove, where the trees on either side grew close to the wheel tracks, five or six men suddenly rushed upon me from both sides of the road and with loud cries of, Kill him! Kill him! Accompanied with oaths and opprobrious language, seized me, dragged me to the ground, and bound me fast with a long cord, which was wrapped around my arms and body, as to confine my hands below my hips. In this condition, I was driven, or rather dragged, about two miles to a kind of tavern or public house that stood by the side of the road, where my captors were joined, soon after daylight, by at least twenty of their companions, who had been out all night waiting and watching for me on the roads of this part of the country. Those who had taken me were loudly applauded by their fellows, and the whole party passed the morning in drinking, singing songs, and playing cards at this house. At breakfast time they gave me a large cake of cornbread and some sour milk for breakfast. About ten o'clock in the morning my master arrived at the tavern, in company with two or three other gentlemen, all strangers to me. My master, when he came into my presence, looked at me and said, Well, you had bad luck in running away this time, and immediately asked aloud what any person would give for me. One man, who was slightly intoxicated, said he would give four hundred dollars for me. Other bids followed, until my price was soon up to five hundred and eighty dollars, for which I was stricken off by my master himself to a gentleman, who immediately gave his note for me and took charge of me as his property. End of chapter 19 Recording by Latha Tia www.audioboyproductions.com Chapter 20, Part 1 of Fifty Years in Chains or the life of an american slave this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by maria casper 50 years in chains or the life of an american slave by charles ball chapter 20 part 1 the name of my new master was Jones, a planter, who was only a visitor in this part of the country, 
his residence being about fifty miles down the country. The next day my new master set off with me to the place of his residence, permitting me to walk behind him as he rode on horseback, and leaving me entirely unshackled. I was resolved that, as my owner treated me with so much liberality, the trust he reposed in me should not be broken until after we had reached his home. Though the determination of again running away and attempting to escape from Georgia never abandoned me for a moment. The country through which we passed on our journey was not rich. The soil was sandy, light, and in many places much exhausted by excessive tillage. The timber in the woods where the ground was high was almost exclusively pine but many swamps and extensive tracts of low ground intervened, in which maple, gum, and all the other trees common to such land in the south abounded. No improvement in the condition of the slaves on the plantations was here perceptible, but it appeared to me that there was now even a greater want of good clothes amongst the slaves on the various plantations that we passed than had existed twenty years before, Everywhere the overseers still kept up the same custom of walking in the fields with the long whip that has been elsewhere described, and everywhere the slaves proved by the husky appearance of their skins and the dry sunburnt aspect of their hair that they were strangers to animal food. On the second day of our journey, in the evening, we arrived at the residence of my master, about eighty miles from Savannah. The plantation which had now become the place of my residence was not large, containing only about three hundred acres of cleared land, and having on it about thirty working slaves of all classes. It was now the very midst of the season of picking cotton, and at the end of twenty years from the time of my first flight I again had a daily task assigned me, with the promise of half a cent a pound for all the cotton I should pick beyond my day's work. Picking cotton, like every other occupation requiring active manipulation, depends more upon slight than strength, and I was not now able to pick so much in a day as I was once able to do. My master seemed to be a man ardently bent on the acquisition of wealth, and came into the field where we were at work almost every day frequently remonstrating in strong language with the overseer because he did not get more work done. Our rations on this place were half a peck of corn per week, in addition to which we had rather more than a peck of sweet potatoes allowed to each person. Our provisions were distributed to us on every Sunday morning by the overseer, but my master was generally present, either to see that justice was done to us or that injustice was not done to himself. When I had been here about a week, my master came into the field one day, and in passing near me stopped and told me that I had now fallen into good hands, as it was his practice not to whip his people much, that he in truth never whipped them, nor suffered his overseer to whip them, except in flagrant cases, that he had discovered a mode of punishment much more mild, and at the same time much more effectual than flogging, and that he governed his negroes exclusively under this mode of discipline. He then told me that when I came home in the evening I must come to the house, and that he would then make me acquainted with the principles upon which he chastised his slaves. Going to the house in the evening, according to orders, my master showed me a pump, set in a well, in which the water rose within ten feet of the surface of the ground. The spout of this pump was elevated at least thirteen feet above the earth, and when the water was to be drawn from it, the person who worked the handle ascended by a ladder to the proper station. The water in this well, although so near the surface, was very cold, and the pump discharged it in a large stream. One of the women employed in the house had committed some offence for which she was to be punished, and the opportunity was embraced of exhibiting to me the effect of this novel mode of torture upon the human frame. The woman was stripped quite naked, and tied to a post that stood just under the stream of water, as it fell from the spout of the pump. A lad was then ordered to ascend the ladder and pump water upon the head and shoulders of the victim, 
who had not been under the waterfall more than a minute before she began to cry and scream in a most lamentable manner. In a short time she exerted her strength in the most convulsive throes in trying to escape from the post, but as the cords were strong this was impossible. After another minute or a little more her cries became weaker, and soon afterwards her head fell forward upon her breast, and then the boy was ordered to cease pumping the water. The woman was removed in a state of insensibility, but recovered her faculties in about an hour. The next morning she complained of lightness of head, but was able to go to work. This punishment of the pump, as it is called, was never inflicted on me, and I am only able to describe it as it has been described to me by those who have endured it. When the water first strikes the head and arms it is not at all painful, but in a very short time it produces the sensation that is felt when heavy blows are inflicted with large rods of the size of a man's finger. This perception becomes more and more painful until the skull-bone and shoulder-blades appear to be broken in pieces. Finally all the faculties become oppressed, breathing becomes more and more difficult, until the eyesight becomes dim and animation ceases. This punishment is, in fact, a temporary murder, as all the pains are endured that can be felt by a person who is deprived of life by being beaten with bludgeons. But after the punishment of the pump, the sufferer is restored to existence by being laid in a bed and covered with warm clothes. A giddiness of the head and oppression of the breast follows this operation for a day or two and sometimes longer. The object of calling me to be a witness of this new mode of torture doubtlessly was to intimidate me from running away, but, like medicines administered by empirics, the spectacle had precisely the opposite effect from that which it was expected to produce. After my arrival on this estate my intention had been to defer my elopement until the next year, before I had seen the torture inflicted on this unfortunate woman but from that moment my resolution was unalterably fixed to escape as quickly as possible. Such was my desperation of feeling at this time that I deliberated seriously upon the project of endeavouring to make my way southward for the purpose of joining the Indians in Florida. Fortune reserved a more agreeable fate for me. On the Saturday night after the woman was punished at the pump, I stole a yard of cotton bagging from the cotton gin house, and converted it into a bag by means of a coarse needle and thread that I borrowed from one of the black women. On the next morning, when our weekly rations were distributed to us, my portion was carefully placed in my bag, under pretense of fears that it would be stolen from me if it was left open in the loft of the kitchen that I lodged in. This day being Sunday, I did not go to the field to work as usual on that day, but, under pretense of being unwell, remained in the kitchen all day, to be better prepared for the toils of the following night. After daylight had totally disappeared, taking my bag under my arm, under pretense of going to the mill to grind my corn, I stole softly across the cotton fields to the nearest woods, and, taking an observation of the stars, directed my course to the eastward, resolved that in no event should anything induce me to travel a single yard on the high road until at least one hundred miles from this plantation. Keeping on steadily through the whole of the night, and meeting with no swamps or briery thickets in my way, I have no doubt that before daylight the plantation was more than thirty miles behind me. Twenty years before this I had been in Savannah, and noted at that time that great numbers of ships were in that port, taking in and loading cotton. My plan was now to reach Savannah in the best way I could, by some means to be devised after my arrival in the city to procure a passage to some of the northern cities. When day appeared before me I was in a large cotton field, and before the woods could be reached it was grey dawn, but the forest bordering on the field was large, and afforded me good shelter through the day, 
under the cover of a large thicket of swamp laurel that lay at the distance of a quarter of a mile from the field. It now became necessary to kindle a fire, for all my stock of provisions, consisting of corn and potatoes, was raw and undressed. Less fortunate now than in my former flight, no fire apparatus was in my possession, and driven at last to the extremity, I determined to endeavor to produce fire by rubbing two sticks together, and spent at least two hours of incessant toil in this vain operation, without the least prospect of success. Abandoning this project at length, I turned my thoughts to searching for a stone of some kind, with which to endeavor to extract fire from an old jackknife that had been my companion in Maryland for more than three years. My labors were fruitless, no stone could be found in this swamp, and the day was passed in anxiety and hunger, a few raw potatoes being my only food. Night at length came, and with it a renewal of my traveling labors. Avoiding with the utmost care every appearance of a road, and pursuing my way until daylight, I must have traveled at least thirty miles this night. A while before day, in crossing a field, I fortunately came upon a bed of large pebbles on the side of a hill. Several of these were deposited in my bag, which enabled me, when day arrived, to procure fire, with which I parched corn and roasted potatoes sufficient to subsist me for two or three days. On the fourth night of my journey, fortune directed me to a broad open highway that appeared to be much travelled. Near the side of this road I established my quarters for the day, in a thick pine wood, for the purpose of making observations upon the people who travelled it, and of judging thence of the part of the country to which it led. Soon after daylight a wagon passed along, drawn by oxen, and loaded with bales of cotton. Then followed some white men on horseback, and soon after sunrise a whole train of wagons and carts, all loaded with bales of cotton, passed by, following the wagon first seen by me. In the course of the day at least one hundred wagons and carts passed along this road, towards the southeast, all laden with cotton bales, and at least an equal number came towards the west, either laden with casks of various dimensions or entirely empty. Numerous horsemen, many carriages, and great numbers of persons on foot also passed to and fro on this road in the course of the day. All these indications satisfied me that I must be near some large town, the seat of an extensive cotton market. The next consideration with me was to know how far it was to this town, for which purpose I determined to travel on the road the succeeding night. Lying in the woods until about eleven o'clock, I rose, came to the road, and travelled it until within an hour of daylight, at which time the country around me appeared almost wholly clear of timber, and houses became much more numerous than they had been in the former part of my journey. Things continued to wear this aspect until daylight, when I stopped and sat down by the side of a high fence that stood beside the road. After remaining here a short time, a wagon laden with cotton passed along, drawn by oxen, whose driver, a black man, asked me if I was going towards town. Being answered in the affirmative, he then asked me if I did not wish to ride in his wagon. I told him I had been out of town all night, and should be very thankful to him for a ride, at the same time ascending his wagon and placing myself in a secure and easy position on the bags of cotton. In this manner we travelled on for about two hours, when we entered the town of Savannah. In my situation there was no danger of any one suspecting me to be a runaway slave, for no runaway had ever been known to flee from the country and seek refuge in Savannah. The man who drove the wagon passed through several of the principal streets of the city, and stopped his team before a large warehouse standing on a wharf looking into the river. Here I assisted my new friend to unload his cotton, and when we were done he invited me to share his breakfast with him, consisting of cornbread, roasted potatoes, and some cold-boiled rice. Whilst we were at our breakfast, a black man came along the street, 
and asked us if we knew where he could hire a hand to help him to work a day or two. I at once replied that my master had sent me to town to hire myself out for a few weeks, and that I was ready to go with him immediately. The joy I felt at finding employment so overcame me that all thought of my wages was forgotten. Bidding farewell to the man who had given me my breakfast, and thanking him in my heart for his kindness, I followed my new employer, who informed me that he had engaged to remove a thousand bales of cotton from a large warehouse to the end of a wharf at which a ship lay, that was taking in the cotton as a load. This man was a slave, but he hired his time of his master at two hundred and fifty dollars a year, which he said he paid in monthly installments. He did what he called job work which consisted of undertaking jobs and hiring men to work under him if the job was too great to be performed by himself. In the present instance he had hired seven or eight black men beside me, all hired to help him remove the cotton in wheelbarrows and lay it near the end of the wharf, when it was taken up by sailors and carried on board the ship that was receiving it. We continued working hard all day and amongst the crew of the ship was a black man with whom I resolved to become acquainted by some means. Accordingly, at night, after we had quit our work, I went to the end of the wharf against which the ship lay moored, and stood there a long time, waiting for the black sailor to make his appearance on deck. At length my desires were gratified. He came upon the deck, and sat down near the mainmast with a pipe in his mouth, which he was smoking with great apparent pleasure. After a few minutes I spoke to him, for he had not yet seen me as it appeared, and when he heard my voice he rose up and came to the side of the ship near where I stood. We entered into conversation together, in the course of which he informed me that his home was in New York, that he had a wife and several children there, but that he followed the sea for a livelihood and knew no other mode of life. He also asked me where my master lived, and if Georgia had always been the place of my residence. I deemed this a favorable opportunity of effecting the object I had in view, in seeking the acquaintance of this man, and told him at once that by law and justice I was a free man, but had been kidnapped near Baltimore, forcibly brought to Georgia, and sold there as a slave that I was now a fugitive from my master, and in search of some means of getting back to my wife and children. The man seemed moved by the account of my sufferings, and at the close of my narrative told me he could not receive me on board the ship, as the captain had given positive orders to him not to let any of the negroes of Savannah come on board, lest they should steal something belonging to the ship. He further told me that he was on watch, and should continue on deck two hours, that he was forced to take a turn of watching the ship every night for two hours, but that his turn would not come the next night until after midnight. I now begged him to enable me to secret myself on board the ship, previous to the time of her sailing, so that I might be conveyed to Philadelphia, whither the ship was bound with her load of cotton. He at first received my application with great coldness, and said he would not do anything contrary to the orders of the captain. But before we parted, he said he should be glad to assist me if he could, but that the execution of the plan proposed by me would be attended with great dangers, if not ruin. End of chapter 20, part 1「Chapter Twenty, Part Two of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. CHAPTER Twenty, PART Two. In my situation there was nothing too hazardous for me to undertake, and I informed him that if he would let me hide myself in the hold of the ship, amongst the bags of cotton, no one should ever know that he had any knowledge of the fact, 
and that all the danger and all the disasters that might attend the affair should fall exclusively on me. He finally told me to go away and that he would think of the matter until the next day. It was obvious that his heart was softened in my favor, that his feelings of compassion almost impelled him to do an act in my behalf that was forbidden by his judgment and his sense of duty to his employers. As the houses of the city were now closed, and I was a stranger in the place, I went to a wagon that stood in front of the warehouse, and had been unladen of the cotton that had been brought in it, and creeping into it, made my bed with the driver, who permitted me to share his lodgings amongst some corn-tops that he had brought to feed his oxen. When the morning came, I went again to the ship, and when the people came on deck, asked them for the captain, whom I should not have known by his dress, which was very nearly similar to that of the sailors. On being asked if he did not wish to hire a hand to help load his ship, he told me I might go to work amongst the men if I chose, and he would pay me what I was worth. My object was to procure employment on board the ship, and not to get wages, and in the course of this day I found means to enter the hold of the ship several times and examine it minutely. The black sailor promised that he would not betray me, and that if I could find the means of escaping on board the ship, he would not disclose it. At the end of three days the ship had taken in her loading, and the captain said in my presence that he intended to sail the day after. No time was now to be lost, and asking the captain what he thought I had earned, he gave me three dollars, which was certainly very liberal pay, considering that during the whole time that I had worked for him my fare had been the same as that of the sailors, who had as much as they could consume of excellent food. The sailors were now busy in trimming the ship and making ready for sea, and observing that this work required them to spend much time in the hold of the ship, I went to the captain and told him that as he had paid me good wages and treated me well, I would work with his people the residue of this day for my victuals and half a gallon of molasses, which he said he would give me. My first object now was to get into the hold of the ship with those who were adjusting the cargo. The first time the men below called for aid, I went to them, and being there took care to remain with them. Being placed at one side of the hold, for the purpose of packing the bags close to the ship's timbers, I so managed as to leave a space between two of the bags, large enough for a man to creep in and conceal himself. This cavity was near the opening in the center of the hold that was left to let men get down to stow away the last of the bags that were put in. In this small hollow retreat among the bags of cotton, I determined to take my passage to Philadelphia, if by any means I could succeed in stealing on board the ship at night. When the evening came, I went to a store near the wharf and bought two jugs, one that held half a gallon, and the other a large stone jug holding more than three gallons. When it was dark, I filled my large jug with water, purchased twenty pounds of pilot bread at a bakery, which I tied in a large handkerchief, and taking my jugs in my hand, went on board the ship to receive my molasses of the captain for the labor of the day. The captain was not on board, and a boy gave me the molasses, but under pretense of wanting to see the captain, I sat down between two rows of cotton bales that were stowed on deck. The night was very dark, and watching a favorable opportunity, when the man on deck had gone forward, I succeeded in placing both my jugs upon the bags of cotton that rose in the hold almost to the deck. In another moment I glided down amongst the cargo, and lost no time in placing my jugs in the place provided for them amongst the bales of cotton, beside the lair provided for myself. Soon after I had taken my station for the voyage, the captain came on board, and the boy reported to him that he had paid me off and dismissed me. In a short time all was quiet on board the ship, except the occasional tread of the man on watch. I slept none at all this night the anxiety that oppressed me preventing me from taking any repose. Before day the captain was on deck, 
and gave orders to the seamen to clear the ship for sailing, and to be ready to descend the river with the ebb tide, which was expected to flow at sunrise. I felt the motion of the ship when she got under way, and thought the time long before I heard the breakers of the ocean surging against her sides. In the place where I lay, when the hatches were closed, total darkness prevailed, and I had no idea of the lapse of time or of the progress we made, until, having at one period crept out into the open space between the rows of cotton bags which I have before described, I heard a man, who appeared from the sound of his voice to be standing on the hatch, call out and say, "'That is Cape Hatteras!' I had already come out of my covert several times into the open space, but the hatches were closed so tightly as to exclude all light. It appeared to me that we had already been at sea a long time, but as darkness was unbroken with me I could not make any computation of periods. Soon after this the hatch was opened, and the light was let into the hold. A man descended for the purpose of examining the state of the cargo, who returned in a short time. The hatch was again closed, and nothing of moment occurred from this time until I heard and felt the ship strike against some solid body. In a short time I heard much noise and a multitude of sounds of various kinds. All this satisfied me that the ship was in some port, for I no longer heard the sound of the waves, nor perceived the least motion in the ship. At length the hatch was again opened, and the light was let in upon me. My anxiety now was to escape from the ship without being discovered by any one, to accomplish which I determined to issue from the hold as soon as night came on, if possible. Waiting until some time after daylight had disappeared, I ventured to creep to the hatchway and raise my head above deck. Seeing no one on board, I crawled out of the hold and stepped on board a ship that lay alongside of that in which I had come a passenger. Here a man seized me and called me a thief, saying I had come to rob his ship, and it was with much difficulty that I prevailed upon him to let me go. He at length permitted me to go on the wharf, and I once more felt myself a free man. I did not know what city I was in, but as the sailors had all told me at Savannah that their ship was bound to Philadelphia, I had no doubt of being in that city. In going along the street, a black man met me, and I asked him if I was in Philadelphia. This question caused the stranger to laugh loudly, and he passed on without giving me any answer. Soon afterwards I met an old gentleman, with drab clothes on, as I could see by the light of the lamps. To him I propounded the same question that had been addressed a few moments before to the black man. This time, however, I received a civil answer, being told that I was in Philadelphia. This gentleman seemed concerned for me, either because of my wretched and ragged appearance, or because I was a stranger, and did not know where I was. Whether for one cause or the other I knew not, but he told me to follow him, and led me to the house of a black man not far off, whom he directed to take care of me until the morning. In this house I was kindly entertained all night, and when the morning came the old gentleman in drab clothes returned, and brought with him an entire suit of clothes, not more than half worn, of which he made me a present, and gave me money to buy a hat and some muslin for a couple of shirts. He then turned to go away, and said, I perceive that thee is a slave, and has run away from thy master. Thee can now go to work for thy living, but take care that they do not catch thee again. I then told him that I had been a slave, and had twice run away and escaped from the state of Georgia. The gentleman seemed a little incredulous of that which I told him, but when I explained to him the cause of the condition in which he found me, he seemed to become more than ever interested in my fate. This gentleman, whose name I shall not publish, has always been a kind friend to me. After remaining in Philadelphia a few weeks, I resolved to return to my little farm in Maryland, for the purpose of selling my property for as much as it would produce, and of bringing my wife and children to Pennsylvania. 
On arriving in Baltimore, I went to a tavern-keeper whom I had formerly supplied with vegetables from my garden. This man appeared greatly surprised to see me, and asked me how I had managed to escape from my master in Georgia. I told him that the man who had taken me to Georgia was not my master, but had kidnapped me and carried me away by violence. The tavern-keeper then told me that I had better leave Baltimore as soon as possible, and showed me a handbill that was stuck up against the wall of his bar-room, in which a hundred and fifty dollars reward was offered for my apprehension. I immediately left this house and fled from Baltimore that very night. When I reached my former residence, I found a white man living in it, whom I did not know. This man, on being questioned by me as to the time he had owned this place and the manner in which he had obtained possession, informed me that a black man had formerly lived here, but he was a runaway slave, and his master had come the summer before and carried him off, that the wife of the former owner of the house was also a slave, and that her master had come about six weeks before the present time and taken her and her children, and sold them in Baltimore to a slave-dealer from the South. This man also informed me that he was not in this neighborhood at the time the woman and her children were carried away, but that he had received this information from a black woman who lived half a mile off. This black woman I was well acquainted with. She had been my neighbor, and I knew her to be my friend. She had been set free some years before by a gentleman of this neighborhood, and resided under his protection on a part of his land. I immediately went to the house of this woman, who could scarcely believe the evidence of her own eyes when she saw me enter her door. The first words she spoke to me were, Lucy and her children have all been stolen away. At my request she gave me the following account of the manner in which my wife and children, all of whom had been free from their birth, were seized and driven into southern slavery. A few weeks, said she, after they took you away, and before Lucy had so far recovered from the terror produced by that event, as to remain in her house all night with her children without some other company, I went one evening to stay all night with her, a kindness that I always rendered her if no other person came to remain with her. It was late when we went to bed, perhaps eleven o'clock, and after we had been asleep some time we were awakened by a loud rap at the door. At first we said nothing, but upon the rap being several times repeated, Lucy asked who was there. She was then told, in a voice that seemed by its sound to be that of a woman, to get up and open the door, adding that the person without had something to tell her that she wished to hear. Lucy, supposing the voice to be that of a black woman, the slave of a lady living near, rose and opened the door. But, to our astonishment, instead of a woman coming in, four or five men rushed into the house and immediately closed the door, at which one of the men stood with his back against it, until the others made a light in the fireplace, and proceeded deliberately to tie Lucy with a rope. Search was then made in the bed for the children, and I was found and dragged out. This seemed to produce some consternation among the captors, whose faces were all black, but whose hair and visages were those of white men. A consultation was held among them, the object of which was to determine whether I should also be taken along with Lucy and the children, or be left behind on account of the interest which my master was supposed to feel for me. It was finally agreed that, as it would be very dangerous to carry me off, lest my old master should cause pursuit to be made after them, they would leave me behind and take only Lucy and the children. One of the number then said it would not do to leave me behind and at liberty, as I would immediately go and give intelligence of what I had seen, and if the affair should be discovered by the members of the Abolition Society before they had time to get out of Maryland, they would certainly be detected and punished for the crimes they were committing. It was finally resolved to tie me with cords to one of the logs of the house, gag me by tying a rope in my mouth and confining it closely to the back of my neck. They immediately confined me, and then took the children from the bed. 
the oldest boy they tied to his mother and compelled them to go out of the house together the three youngest children were then taken out of bed and carried off in the hands of the men who had tied me to the log i never saw nor heard any more of lucy or her children for myself i remained in the house the door of which was carefully closed and fastened after it was shut until the second night after my confinement without anything to eat or drink on the second night some unknown persons came and cut the cords that bound me when i returned to my own cabin this intelligence almost deprived me of life it was the most dreadful of all the misfortunes that i had ever suffered it was now clear that some slave dealer had come in my absence and seized my wife and children as slaves and sold them to such men as i had served in the south they had now passed into hopeless bondage and were gone forever beyond my reach i myself was advertised as a fugitive slave and was liable to be arrested at each moment and dragged back to georgia i rushed out of my own house in despair and returned to pennsylvania with a broken heart for the last few years i have resided about fifty miles from philadelphia where i expect to pass the evening of my life in working hard for my subsistence without the least hope of ever again seeing my wife and children fearful at this day to let my place of residence be known lest even yet it may be supposed that as an article of property i am of sufficient value to be worth pursuing in my old age end of chapter twenty part two end of fifty years in chains or the life of an american slave by charles ball <laughs>